It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. Alex Kantrowitz from the Big Technology Podcast and Newsletter joins us. Ed Bott from the Ed Bott Report on ZDNet. And it's Rich tomorrow from Rich on Tech. We'll talk about Apple's big event coming up and why AirTags might not be the best thing that ever happened. Uh, we'll also talk about Jeff Bezos' letter to Amazon shareholders and what it holds for the future. And a big victory for Elon Musk. It's all coming up next on Twit. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. Twit. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 819, recorded Sunday, April 18th, 2021. Introducing Club Twit. This Week in Tech is brought to you by IT Pro TV. Expand the skills of your IT team and get them the up-to-date certificates they need by visiting itpro.tv slash twit. And for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription, use the code TWIT30 at checkout. And by Worldwide Technology and Cisco. When was the last time your company updated your security strategy? Are your business assets protected? WWT combines strategy and execution to secure your organization and drive business outcomes. Visit WWT.com slash TWIT to get started. And by... Podium. Find out how Podium can help your business reach more customers. Get started free today at Podium.com slash twit. And by Uber for Business. Right now, for a limited time, receive a $50 voucher when you create your first vouchers campaign and spend $200. Go to Uber.com slash twit to learn more. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show where we cover the week's tech news with some of my favorite people in the world. Say hello to Rich DeMuro from KTLA and Rich on Tech. Hello, Rich. Hello, Leo. <laughs> good to see you, Rich on Tech.tv. I haven't seen you in an age. In a bit, but good to see you as well. <laughs> the Thanks for having me today. last time I saw you, you were wearing a, a uh, plastic tent to protect yourself from the rain and COVID. It's that that yeah that's been a while that yeah, uh, what was that thing time. called the the weather pod <laughs> the it weather was, pod uh, we sh <laughs> <laughs> they sent me this thing we did a fun video and it went viral and viral. Uh, I've viral. never heard the end of it yeah you're are you on TikTok are you on the TikTok you ought to be. I you know I'm I'm not on TikTok I have I have an account but I have not I think I posted one thing so far and someone just told me to but I I haven't checked to see <laughs> you've got if it did do you have okay you have a renegade social media manager don't you is that what's going on. I no, this was just a random person on Twitter oh. who said, "Hey, you should take that video you did and post it to TikTok." And I said, "Sure," and I did, and that was <laughs> that was the last I thought of it. I just one so. of the is we have a big announcement today. I'm going to start my own TikTok. It's called Lip Lock, and I've already registered. No, that's not the announcement. Also here, Ed Bot, old friend, dear old friend from uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Hello, Ed. Hey, Leo. Good to see you again. From ZDNet, the Ed Bot Report, longtime tech journalist. When they say that about us, Ed, you know, senior. What they mean is, oh, man, you guys are old. Senior tech journalist. <laughs> I, I told Walt Mossberg that. I said, yeah, you're the senior, the eminence grease <laughs> tech journalism. <laughs> oh, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of grease here. Yeah, a lot of grease. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Also with us, big tech. He's the big tech at uh, bigtechnology.substack.com. Alex Kantrowitz. Great to see you again, Alex. Great to see you. It's you have the, to be back here, Leo. You have the award of, for the longest microphone. Well, I don't know. You and Rich, you're, you're tied. Oh, that's annoying. It, this is the camera angle. We're, we're playing tricks. Oh, okay. That's okay. what it's supposed to be you like. You should put this closer to the camera to be okay. Yeah. Hey, before we get to the news, we have some news ourselves at Twit. Lisa's here uh, with me. It's something that we've been working on for some time. When we first launched Twit, you know, I come from ad-supported media. I mean, I've worked in radio and TV for years, and everything I did was free uh, and ad supported and twit uh, initially when we first started it it was free and not ad supported that wasn't so tenable <laughs> then we we were lucky in the first year we were able to start uh, selling advertising we've done very well i think as a free ad supported network but we've been getting a lot of i don't know i think uh, interest from our audience uh 
and I've been watching people like you, Alex, move from traditional mainstream media to uh, to Substack. Uh, as uh, Ben Thompson, uh, what does he call it? The um, sovereign writer. Uh, sovereign writer. You're a sovereign writer. And I thought maybe we should be a sovereign podcast. So we thought let's try this. And I and I hope you will. I hope you will like this idea. We are going to continue to sell ads on our shows. We'll continue to be an ad supported network, free to anybody who doesn't mind hearing some ads. But we've heard from enough people who say, you know, I don't want to hear the ads. I don't want to be tracked, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that we've decided to offer an ad free version of Twit. Uh, no ads means we need to make money somehow, so we're going to start something we call Club Twit. Uh, for $7 a month, you'll get ad-free versions of all of our shows. You'll get a special dedicated address that's just for you, that uh, is your feed specifically for you of ad-free content. And I mean all the shows will be ad-free available. We're then also going to do another feed, which is Twit Plus. The Twit Plus feed will include outtakes, pre-shows, special content, uh, stuff that we maybe couldn't afford to do in the past as an ad-supported thing. There's quite a few shows that we just weren't able to get enough audience for to do uh, an ad-supported version. That might also be part of Twit Plus. And we are also going to open a special Discord channel. We call it Club Twit. And uh, as a member, you'll also have access to that. So I think that's a pretty good package, $7 a month twit.tv slash club twit to uh, find out more. I hope for those of you who've wanted an ad-free version of a twit and who've wanted additional content, things like the Giz Fizz on feeds, uh, I hope this will solve that, uh, scratch that itch for you. We're very excited about it. I think it's going to be a, a, a great way for us to continue to put out the same quality content and maybe even more content than ever before um, without just you know, without having to wait for advertisers to say, okay, we like that idea. We want you to say you like the idea. So I hope you like the idea. Uh, again, twit.tv slash uh, club, seven bucks a month. There's somebody in the chat and say, I actually like the ads. That's great. That's fine. And I, and we're going to continue to do that um, because we. I also like the ads in the, in the sense that I think it's always good to have a free version uh, for people who uh, can't afford or don't want to spend the money. I think seven bucks a month is a pretty fair price. We went back and forth on the price, and that seemed like the 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 sweet spot. So uh, it's worked for you, Alex, right? I mean, I think that's a good way to go. Yeah, I'm actually building uh, big technology quite in the same way that you, you guys followed. So actually right now I'm entirely ad-supported. So the podcast, Big Technology Podcast, and the newsletter – are free uh, exactly. in their full version exactly. to everyone. Yeah. And the idea is let's grow it. And yep. then when it's at a point where we can build some community around it right. and deliver some extra features for a subscription fee, then I'm going to go to that. Um, That's what Substack is, is kind of designed for, right? I didn't realize yeah, you could do it free as well. That's nice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that most of the writers go to Substack because you hear about like the high profile writers, people like Casey Newton or Charlie Warzel or Glenn Greenwald. Uh, they immediately go to subscription because they already have a critical mass of fans that can sustain their business. So Glenn Greenwald is making over a million dollars a year on yeah, but uh, Substack didn't, already. Didn't uh, Substack mm -hmm. pay him initially? No, actually, Glenn, I don't think Glenn took he the wasn't advance. One Some of others, oh. like Matt Iglesias, did. Yeah. I didn't take the advance. And yeah. I said, you know, I'm still like in the middle class of content creators, and I'm not going to be able to generate enough annual revenue on subscriptions. I mean, my list is okay. It's 9,300 people, um, but I figured that that would really lend itself better to an ad-supported model. Yeah. Uh, and so that's far, what we so did. good. Yeah, that's yeah, what we did. It's the right move. I, yeah. And I think that what you guys are doing is super exciting because at a certain point, you grow and you build to a critical mass where it's time to, you know, give some of your super fans a little bit more. Yeah. You know, allow them to skip those ads, give them yeah. some extra content. Yeah. And that's what I'm working towards, too. So I'm excited to see you guys take the step and we should compare notes somewhere this down has the line, been see the, how it's going. If there is a trend in the last couple of years, this sovereign writer trend, and not just for writers, but also for podcasters, seems to have been the mm -hmm. trend. Move away from people like Alexis Madrigal um, and uh, the person you just mentioned who left, uh, um, was it Vox? Where, where were Yeah, Casey Newton. Matt Iglesias. Casey, uh, Matt Iglesias, yeah. Casey Newton. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. They've all said, you know what? I have a brand. Why don't I just do it myself? And I think that that's a, I think Sovereign Podcasters is an interesting idea as well. Anyway, we'll try it. We'll see. I hope people like it. Um, what do you think, Ed? You've been with us since the very beginning. Yeah, I mean, this is, I was thinking about that this week, you know, watching a lot of the 
the discussion, the, you know, the discourse about what's going on with Substack. And it reminds me of the early days of blogging, you know, around, exactly. the, around, the, turn of, yeah. you know, around the turn of this century, when a whole bunch of people started businesses that, you know, made them money for a while. Some of them have stuck around, people like Josh Marshall, um, have turned it into, you know, turned it into good sustaining businesses. And then, you know, and then Facebook and Google got involved and distorted all of the, all the content business models. And I think, I, I think it looks like what we're doing now is starting to disrupt Facebook and Google out yes. of the picture. And I'm, so I'm all content for that. Creators can, you know, can, can get involved without those, without those intermediaries, either yeah. in advertising or in uh, reaching the, the, readers, viewers, listeners. Yeah. Yeah. I'm all for that. Absolutely. Anything to just intermediate, uh, the, you know, Facebook <laughs> is fine with me. Yeah. And we, we've learned our lesson too, by the way, like anyone who's starting a new business now, we've seen all these publications, you know, go all the way in on Facebook and Google in the hopes for traffic or support that never really came. And so now when it's up to us in terms of the way to run our business, uh, we, we'll, we'll obviously send emails that will touch Gmail or do podcasts that will touch Apple. Uh, and maybe people will share our stories on Facebook. But like Facebook's going to try to get into this newsletter game. Facebook is starting audio only stuff that we're about to hear about this week. And I think a lot of us who are coming up now, we know, you know, that is a bargain uh, that's one with the devil. And, you know, it might give you some better results short term. But if you want to be successful in the long term, stay away, build it sustainably. And so that it doesn't end up collapsing on you sometime in the future. It's been, you know, it's funny because, and Rich, you probably more than anybody have been through all this. I started in broadcast media like you and um, broadcast media has been very good to me um, as it has been to you. But at some point you kind of want to uh, spread your wings and radio in particular <laughs> has been faltering over the last 10 years. I can't tell you how many radio guys I've worked with who said, how did you do this twit thing? Tell me what you do. What, how do I become a podcaster? Because, you know, radio is, is starting to get a little shaky. People are leaving their jobs uh, or their jobs more likely are leaving them. There have been lots of layoffs in the last couple of years. Uh, and so I think it makes sense. If you, if you want to be a content creator, owning your own stuff in the long run, this makes sense. And when it, when I started this in 2005 and 2006, podcasting was in its infancy. Um, and now I think it's mature, it's very mature. And we're starting to see podcasting become big media with Spotify and iHeart and others kind of dominating podcasting platform. And unfortunately, um, you know, one of the reasons Spotify can give Alex, uh, uh, Joe Rogan, um, $100 million is because they can say, well, you're going to be exclusive on our platform, which means people have to listen to what was tr traditionally a podcast or on YouTube and open, have to listen to it on Spotify, which means they can track people. And that's become right. hard for us because uh, it's hard to sell against, you know, advertiser has a choice between buying us and getting enthusiasts and geeks, but they don't know anything about them or going to Spotify where they not only know everything about them down to their credit card number, they even know what part of the shows they did and didn't listen to. And uh, I don't want to get into that game with Spotify. That's a tough game to play. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've just been watching this very closely, and I, I find it fascinating. I mean, the you know, I've worked for a, a media company all my life, and um, you know, it, it's really. I talk about this all the time with my wife, how when I started, it's like the only way to reach someone was to go through that conduit, you know, that that channel, that radio station, whatever. And in my career, I've seen over and over every single way that we used to reach people, you can now do on your own without someone. And I'm not saying that, you know, I'm ready to jump off or do anything like that, but it's just, it's fascinating that we never had that opportunity as journalists yeah. to go direct to the people. Now, here's what I think is happening. And I, I think it's amazing that people can support their, you know, the creators they love and the networks that they love. But I think we're seeing this subscription, um, the, we've heard of the term subscription fatigue. And so that worries me. World, that worries well, me a but, little bit. But I think here's what's going to happen, Leo. I think someone's going to, some smart aggregator is going to come along and say, you pay us, you know, whatever, 10 bucks a month, and you get to pick five subscriptions. Now, I know that sounds anti to everything we're seeing happening, but if someone's sitting there going, hmm, I add up all these things and it's 30 bucks a month, but I can get 25 through this aggregator and then people will sign on, you know, it's just, 
I feel like that is probably going to happen. We're going to come back full circle to like the cable model where it's like all these channels and you say, okay, but it's going to be much more flexible where you can pick and choose every month or, you know, six months, whatever. I don't know. I just feel like there's something, you know, cause I love supporting like seven bucks a month is great. You know, it's like, it doesn't sound like that much for something you love. Um, but you know, I'm sitting here with all yeah. the things that I you have $107 a month. month things. It starts to add up. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and right and now we all have that limit of like that, whatever we are paying for cable, right? Like maybe $200. You're like, okay, yeah. if I'm over that, I'm, I'm too much, but as long as I'm under that, I'm okay. So there's like this weird, you know, mental, uh, I don't know, line in your head. I don't know, but I, I find it fascinating. I, I love what's going on. I, think I do worry about that. Uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, that, that's absolutely the case. Although I have to say, we're getting, I think we're getting a little bit more used to it because everybody's got Netflix and Amazon Prime and, and uh, you know, I mean, it just starts to add up and I think we're just kind of getting used to it. But uh, I don't well, know. Well, this is what Apple, uh, Apple tried, has tried to do this with magazines and newspapers with uh, Apple News Plus. Is that what they call it? Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, and and I don't know how successful they've been. With I don't that. think the newspapers and magazines like it very much. The only ones that that like it are ones that don't have a big subscriber base or a national audience, so they like the exposure. But I don't think and, it's worked and, well and, for the right. New York Times and, and the Wall Street Journal. And that's exactly where this uh, and that's exactly where this plays out here. Those who already have a good solid base, either because they're a you know, they're somebody who has a, a brand that's that's it that's instantly monetizable in Substack, or people who have a brand that accrues to them through the media outlet that they're with. You know, those people are going to be okay and they're going to be independent, but a whole bunch of other people who are in that second and third tier uh, are probably going to see some advantage to saying, "Look, I would rather get uh, two dollars each." from somebody aggregating me into something right. then try and convince people to pay me five, seven or $10 a month and know that I'm not going to make the cut. I'm not going to make their, their, uh, you know, whatever their threshold is. What they don't like is that they don't get the ad, the email address. They don't get the information about the customer. Mm -hmm. That's what customers like. That's what Apple likes. They, they hold that, but the newspapers don't get that. And they want to build a, they would love to build a relationship uh, with their subscribers. And that's what the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal have done so very well. That's why they're so uh, successful. Yeah, and this is, by the, just to jump in quickly, this is the key part to like asking whether some of these writers, independent podcasters, are going to want to go in a bubble, uh, in a bundle. You know, because they are, at the end of the day, independent-minded. They don't want to be working right. under right. the auspices of a publication. They want that direct relationship with the readers. And if they're only getting 2 or $3 from a, a bundle, you know, per subscriber, they're going to, you know, probably attribute more uh, to themselves than to the being part of the bundle. Uh, and, and by the way, people subscribing to a bundle of Substack writers, they're probably better off subscribing to a publication anyway. So I right. think that like, you know, and, and a lot of these news publications are learning their lesson in terms of playing ball with Apple on, on this bundle with the Apple News Plus. So, you know, I'm definitely, um, you know, I've talked to people about joining a bundle of Substack writers. Honestly, it's just more fun doing it on my own right now. And I think that's going to be what happens by and large is that Substack writers are going to stay independent. And it was scary. As hard a, as they can. a scary move for you, though, wasn't it? I, I actually felt that I had, um, you know, no other option. Uh, it, it was the, the timing was was wild. Uh, my book came out in April 2020. Uh, and I wanted to keep writing on the topics in the book, but I wasn't going to have a chance to do that as a staff reporter and said, um, you know, let's just make the plunge. And I had a relationship with people, uh, you know, on a newsletter, I was writing for Buzzfeed anyway, and they all came over with their email addresses uh, to the new thing. And uh, I don't know, I personally have high risk tolerance. So I was just like, let's just go. <laughs> You're jump young, off that's and, why. <laughs> and see what happens. Alex, yeah, do you, so that was helpful. Do you feel like it's, uh, you know, exciting to kind of, you know, what you do on a daily basis directly. I mean, you can see when you get the subscribers and you get the, you mm -hmm. know, the paid subscribers, especially like, do you feel that, I mean, that's got to come with an energy that you probably never had before working for someone else. No doubt. I mean, to like this, you have to like being an entrepreneur. So I'm not only doing 
the writing and I get to assign myself the stories and book the guests for the you know big technology podcast. But I'm doing the business deals too, or I have a sales guy working with me now on advertising. Uh, and we're going to say a little bit more about that this week. But like getting a chance to steer the entire ship uh, is something that was always exciting to me as a prospect. And, you know, get, now getting a chance to do that um, definitely is super fulfilling to me and something that I was always hoping to do. And it's nice to be able to, you know, live that out. We tried when we first started Twit. I, I thought, oh, no, advertisers will just have a tip jar. That didn't work so well because there was no <laughs> infrastructure around it. That's the other thing that's changed dramatically. Things like Substack. Uh, we're using Memberful, which is a Patreon company i mean uh jack has really uh, patreon has been huge for people and, that, and now of course there, there's only fans there's substack there's medium there's a lot of ways to go uh, is this another announcement leo i am starting my only fans <laughs> channel <laughs> now the big news that's the real news okay you I ought to see the reveal. lingerie set i just bought no, you don't want to see that. Don't worry, I'm not doing. <laughs> I'm not so doing I, I think that it, that's another interesting side to this is that as a content, so they have this thing on Facebook called Stars, and I don't know if anyone has seen these or used them, but uh, it showed up on my account one day, and it's like people can leave you stars. So when you do something interesting, uh, people can leave like uh, I don't know a couple of stars, like a penny or two. And so you buy them in bulk, you know, you can buy like $20 worth of stars and leave them for, for people. And so I think that that's another part of this whole situation that has not really, we, you know, in, in the past in the web, they talked about it back in the beginning where it was like you would, you know, give people a penny for an article or something. But I think that's another side of it. Is the micropayments thing. That was going exactly. to be the savior. It never happened. And it, it never happened. But I, I think we can, I don't think the, the thought process was in place for that to happen or the infrastructure. But at this point, again, another smart person comes up with a way and, you know, maybe it's Jack at Patreon, but, you know, if someone comes up with a way where I just have a little bucket on my, you know, a, a Chrome extension with, you know, $25 loaded up and I read a good article and I go, ding, and I just give someone, you know, a penny or two or whatever their suggested, you know, Brave's doing is. that actually, isn't it? Uh, Brave has those Brave attention tokens. It's a crypto currency, but they, because they it's a browser with an ad blocker, they thought, well, if we could have some way of donating to the sites you visit that you're not seeing their ads, I don't know how well that's working, but I think I think it's an interesting experiment anyway. Um, and I, I think people want to support. And we've come to the place where since there are so many independents out there, we've well, come that's to the place where we want to support them. I mean, think about <laughs> the tips you leave. You know, you go to a coffee place and yeah. you tip the person always, a buck for you, handing you a coffee. Especially now, yeah, because everybody's struggling a little bit. So, um Anyway, that's my news. That's the that's the story. Thank you for uh, putting up with that. Uh, that's not the big news of the week. Maybe the big news of the week is Apple's going to have an event on Tuesday, spring loaded, and all the uh, all the Apple haters are going. That's not the news, Leo. But I'm going to just start with that. We'll just <laughs> well because I think they loaded implies they're probably going to announce a lot of things. We, we've thought for a long time that this would be the place where they would announce an iPad Pro. Perhaps finally announce their long awaited air tags there's some evidence that that's actually going to finally happen um but there's also just a rumor came out today or yesterday that there are going to be multicolored imax redesigned imax on tuesday as well any thoughts uh about that you you cover you, you wrote the book on the iphone rich are you are you excited I, about tuesday i i mean look i you know i cover tech news for a living and consumer tech news and apple stuff always is People the most popular yeah. no matter what yeah. um you know an ipad pro to a consumer audience is a really tough sell you know you're not it's not the sexiest thing in the world it's laptop um, priced you know you're you're basically yeah, it's you could buy a, a macbook cheaper yeah i think i think the air tags have potential to be huge if those ever see the light of day i think it's it's odd that they announced the the Find My expansion last week with you know Chipolo, which makes little tags like Tile. Um, so it's you know, and Apple definitely makes products that other people you know they partner with Peloton forever, and now all of a sudden they you know make their own Apple Fitness Plus. So I think the AirTags have potential to be huge for the average person. Um, the M1 chip are are the iMacs going to have the M1 in them? Probably right. Or M1X, or, you know, we don't know. Apple's naming convention is is weird. The iPad Pro will finally catch up uh, with the M1. It'll basically be an M1 in the iPad Pro, I think, an M1X. Um, you know, they could, look at this, they're silicon. They control it completely. They could do, 
a new chip. We haven't heard any rumors from uh, the supply chain like TSMC who makes those chips, but who knows? It, what we do think, or the rumor is, and it's a fairly well-positioned rumor uh, source, that uh, it will be a redesigned iMac, which, you know, is probably a good idea. The Find My thing cracked me up because it was very... That's one of the reasons I think AirTags is coming out. It was very clearly to say, look, Tile, because Tile's been bitching. You know, we're going to open it up. Tile notably did not join the, the, the crew of third parties. Van Moof Bicycles, an electric... Actually, I love the name. They're, they're good electric yeah. bikes, but they're expensive. We'll have bucks. Yeah. They have this little logo on locate with Apple Find My. Uh I never heard of Chipolo. You'd heard of Chipolo before? I never heard of them. Yeah, they they were at CES uh many, many years ago. And the big difference is is that you can replace the battery. You know, right. tile the whole thing it dies. is that after yeah. a year you gotta recycle it with them, you right. know, get a new one. But Chipolo has like just a, one of those, you know, standard batteries in it. Is that you know, like a flat battery, I forget what they're called. Yeah. The like a Lithium, A3200 lithium. or something. Right, right, right. Whatever. Um, um, starts shipping in June. You'll have to get the Chipolo one spot. What if you left your Chipolo in Chipotle? Would that be... Conf <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just being stupid. And then uh, Belkin has a wireless earbud. I'm surprised it's just those three. I would... Hey, if I made a gadget that's easy to lose or expensive like a bike, I probably would want to put this in here. I think this is a good idea. And I love the idea of opening Find My... And not only seeing my laptops, my phone, but also seeing other stuff that I can't find. Apparently, the um, the person uh, Apple's using uh, for the demonstration of this lost everything in Golden Gate Park. They got a backpack here. They got a bike there. They got their headphones over here. <laughs> Clearly, a little too much partying. It probably yeah. I, I think this this Find My is so huge because it l leverages every Apple product out there. And well, and also you know, the, the one advantage Apple has also is this UWB chip, this ultra wideband chip, which lets you point your phone and get it as like a direction finder. So if you lost right. your keys under the sofa, you can actually figure out that's where they are. That's huge. Nobody does that. And, and the fact that it's baked into the operating system versus Tile was always a third party. That's you know, on Tile Android, it probably yeah. ran in the background. But like with Apple, it probably didn't. I don't know if it ran in the background, but it probably did not right. uh, based on their architecture of iOS. So the fact that this is running in the background all the time on every iPhone, you know, I don't know what the opt-in process is like, but the reality is this has potential to be huge. I mean, nothing m may ever be lost again if you have one of these AirTags on it or a Chipolo. Uh, you know, if it's, I think it's pretty wild how how wide ranging this could be. I uh, we will be covering it. I'll be getting up early. Uh, well, ten a.m. It's not that early. I can't come. <laughs> <laughs> early ish. Okay, I'm supposed to be here at eleven, so it's a little early. Uh, ten a.m. Uh, Monday or Tuesday uh, Pacific. Uh, that's one p.m. Eastern time. Uh, Micah Sargent and I will be covering the event. Then we'll do Mac Break Weekly immediately after. Uh, Ed, do you care? You don't. You don't use anything Apple, do you? Do you? I no. I have. I have uh, an iPhone. Uh, oh, just in fact, just got two days ago. Oh, uh, twelve Pro Max. Nice, huh? Um, wow. And yeah, very the big very boy. Nice, yeah, very very nice device. Uh, and I I have a, uh, a I was, MacBook Pro here. Oh, I think of uh, you as a Windows guy for some reason. Well, I, I am, but in it's you know it's it's 2021. You don't nobody stays in one camp anymore, except for some really hardcore Apple people who just buy everything Apple. You know, uh, but but if you if you want, you know, I I have Android devices here. I have Windows uh, devices. Um, you know, car has CarPlay and Android Auto in it, and I will. I love, by the them, way, try them both. Uh, either one, but I I have CarPlay and Android, but I use CarPlay. But it, I love that. Then I don't have to use. It's funny. I have a, a Ford Mach E, and I guess because they have to, they include you know their own maps and their own stuff. But who wants to use that? Don't you want to use the always updating phone uh, stuff? But see. Isn't it? Because so, so here's you the came thing. from a Tesla, and they didn't. They oh, the use Tesla's their own system. Terrible, and it's terrible. Which I find so. It's like the best car in the world, and the you can't use the best system. Yeah, right. 
I know. I don't understand. So we just got we we just got a new car a couple of months ago. We got a Volvo. And I was in the same camp in our previous cars, which were Fords. But the um uh the Volvo has its own app and its own mapping system that I think is it is definitely superior to Apple Maps and it is superior to Google Maps. We just um basically there's a on the screen you can you can just scribble in the name of the destination that you want oh, that's with your cool. finger. <laughs> uh, which is really nice. Or you can use the app to find it, which and then it will use Google Maps to locate it. It will oh, send it to the car and then you can navigate it there. And the, the killer feature for me is that it puts your current position and all your navigation instructions both in the console right in front of you, in between the speedometer and, you know, right right there and in the heads up display. That's nice. So yeah. So, so yeah, so I've found myself using the built-in navigation there in preference. That's the only thing in CarPlay that I don't use anymore. And we used to use Google Maps in CarPlay all the time, which was, you know, about as ecumenical as you can get. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll see what happens on uh, Tuesday. I just thought I'd give you a little uh, heads up on that. Um, Isn't it, by the way, I mean, I'm just thinking about the yeah. Apple product yes, Alex. lineup. Yes. And isn't it, I, I was like looking at what's going to happen and my eyes kind of glossed over. Like, I'm curious <laughs> what you guys think because. Are you bored? Okay, are you, are you I, done with Apple? Not with this show, with the Apple products a little bit. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. it's yeah. like, all right, what are the big announcements we're expecting? Maybe an iPad, uh, you know, different colors on the MacBook and then a carbon copy of Tile. And it's interesting, you know, looking at Apple, a company that we used to like, you know, kind of count down the days to see their next big product reveal. And this is what we're dealing with now. And for me, like the more interesting stories about Apple are like, what's going on with the battles with their app store? You right. Know, I, I, you know, what's going on with their fight with Fortnite and what's going to, you know, play out with Tile? Um, well, we so can it's certainly talk that about that, too. Yeah, like we're starting to move, and maybe this is just me, but I feel like when the conversation about Apple is starting to move from look at the awesome power of these products to, you know, is this company wielding its power in a way uh, that is detrimental to markets and detrimental to others? And I just think it's marking a really interesting shift in terms of what's happening with Apple. And I know it's not going to win me many friends to say that. Well, they're playing it that's safe. That's kind of my reaction. I mean, we are, yeah. for everybody, uh, we're at peak technology we haven't i mean you know until the augmented reality glasses or whatever the next big thing is comes along that's normal you've seen this ed several many times right you hit right you hit a plateau and there's no innovation for years i mean that 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 i expect right they're in the they're in the rent extraction phase yes that's, right, that's right one now. way to put it yes yeah there's a, and there's a great deal of of rent to be uh, extracted here. I mean, I think, and of course, everyone has been waiting for, um, you know, the Apple self-driving car or the, or whatever they do with a car. But even there, I don't expect it to be magical and revolutionary. But I mean, honestly, Apple, I mean, maybe you're a little jaded, Alex. Apple, just the last announcement announced that they were abandoning Intel and creating their whole, a whole new chip architecture just for Macintoshes. That's a pretty powerful thing to say. That's, that's, I mean, don't you think that's a significant announcement? Yeah, no, that's a big deal. And I won't discount that at all. Yeah. Uh, let's see what it looks like in production. You know, oh, I love it. I already have an M1 oh, yeah. power I mean, I, I I can uh, Yeah. It's impressive. Yeah. You can feel it, the it, difference it, in I, your computer. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Alex, mm -hmm. let me get you one. You got to see. It's okay. amazing. The reviews, were, the, the reviews yeah. were impressive. Like the feedback has mm -hmm. been, you know, across the board. Like it it was pretty impressive. But but I, I see what Alex is saying. I mean, this is the thing about Apple is that, you know, they, they come in and, you know, for probably for many years, and this is why I, I talked about the architecture of iOS. iOS, you know, is, is very secure and they love to talk about their security. But you know, the uh, Apple does things their way and their, you know, services and things have a little bit more um, leeway on their operating system than other apps, right? So this whole Find My, 
is going to be running 24 seven in the background of iOS where tile, I don't believe was ever allowed to do that. And so just by that little tiny distinction, the Apple find my system works and it works in a big way. At, whereas but, tile was, at, at a cost, was never able to work because it's ecosystem lock-in. The ecosystem lock-in, that's the cost. But it's not, but if they're doing third party, it makes it seem like you're welcome into this, but we all know that that's a licensed thing that, you know, yeah, yeah. they're working with Belkin, who is a, you know, obviously a, a, a very tight knit uh, company with Apple. How about this? Van I'm, Move. I mean, I'm challenged. Alex has challenged me. Now I'm going to give you another one, Alex, because right. one of the things we expect to hear on Tuesday is mm -hmm. the uh, introduction of iOS 14.5. And you know, as somebody who's been writing about Facebook, that Facebook is terrified of what Apple is about to do. For the first time ever, I mean, you in a, on an iPhone, when you install a new app, the app will have to tell you it's pro what, what permissions it wants. And most specifically, will have to ask you for permission to track you. Uh, Facebook's saying this is bad for small business. It's bad for Facebook. Uh, people are really worried about this i think this is only a company like apple with the kind of ecosystem it has could say uh yeah in fact we're gonna we're gonna screw all of you guys who want to track our users no um don't you think that's a big deal i think that's a huge deal yeah well I'm, i've actually have two minds about it so i actually do like the privacy stuff that apple yeah. is introducing and apple you know, I, so I wrote the book looking at the culture and leadership practices of the big five tech companies. And without a doubt, the employees I spoke with let me know that Apple is the one that takes user privacy most seriously on the inside. You know, Google, Facebook, relatively easy, or at least it has been relatively easy to get user data. At Apple, it's a huge pain in the butt. Uh, so, you know, I think that they're, they, they do walk the walk and talk the talk. But I wish they were a little bit more upfront about why they were talking the talk. So why is Apple so against Facebook. And of course, you know, maybe Tim Cook does have it in his heart that, you know, Facebook is inherently unjust and must be, you know, reined in. But he should also mention the fact that they're competing with them based off of product. So, you know, you talked about ecosystem lock-in, right? iMessage locks people into the iPhone and the Mac uh, yes. because they know if they were going to switch off, they become green bubbles and their group chats were going to break. Right Now, when people start using Facebook's products, things like Messenger, WhatsApp, Instagram, it becomes so much easier to switch off an iPhone, switch off a Mac, because the most important thing you do with those phones is communicate with your friends and family. And if you can do that just as easily on an Android as you can in the iPhone, not have to worry about coming up as a green mobile, not have to worry about breaking your group chats, then you can make that switch more easily. And Apple knows this and Facebook knows this. And only Facebook is willing to say that actually like, you know, they're competitors with Apple, whereas Apple's trying to play this as like, we're taking the moral high ground by making you more aware of privacy while trying to kneecap their competitor. Of course. And then we could talk for, for hours <laughs> about the business. fact that they're, yeah, <laughs> and, and, and their job. not only that, yeah, and Facebook's <laughs> going after the next big operating system that Apple has its eyes on, which is, you know, virtual reality. Facebook right. has a ton of people working on Oculus. Apple is dilly-dallying with AR, but we've heard about forever and we haven't seen anything. So I think we need to just like have the context with it. Yes, these privacy moves are big. I welcome them as a consumer. I want to have more privacy, but I also want more honesty from Apple, you know, talking about what it's doing to solidify the power of its own ecosystem, the anti-competitive component of this as well. And I don't expect us to hear that from Tim Cook anytime soon, because I think the media tends to give him a pretty big pass and say, look at this man. He's standing up for the values we all believe in uh, without looking one layer deeper. So that, well, that's my hope. I agree with you. And stuff. I mean, uh, we talk about on Mac Break Weekly, uh, mm -hmm. Apple's position with China. Um, Apple tried to do its own ad platform and failed. So yeah. they've embraced, you know, blocking and uh, tracking. Um and and it's clearly a, you know it's a it's a it's a profit making company. This is a marketing thing. We're for privacy. Those other guys aren't, but mm -hmm. they're also walking the walk. It's not just the talk. I mean, I think they are making good moves uh, in favor of privacy. And whether they're doing it because they're altruistic, I don't think any corporation is altruistic. Their right. job is to make money, and uh, it's good business. So it's Wouldn't good it business. Nice it's good for that. us. Wouldn't oh, they're nice not going to gonna say once? it's good yeah. business. They're not going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's going to ever say that. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, we can at least add the proper context. Yeah, I think you're absolutely like right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, I think I think it's 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 pretty clear. Apple's a corporation. It's you know I think there are a lot of Apple fans going way back to the earliest days who, you know, love the company and have this mm -hmm. great you know this is my team and it's 
uh, the computer for the rest of us and I think differently. But everybody, if you think about it, knows you may love Apple, but Apple doesn't love you. They love your money. That's right. Yeah. One nice thing about like what they're doing here is it shows us the power of the markets, functioning markets, right? Providing exactly what they want. If we want, want privacy. Uh, then Apple wins. Apple if people don't. Facebook wins wins. by providing so cool. people with something they ask for. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that I will watch on Tuesday with what they announce. But you, I, I can almost promise you, get your bingo card ready. Privacy will come up. Uh, you know, even even Microsoft saying this. And the last time Satya Nadella came on stage, he talked about trust and uh, and um, uh, sovereignty and things like that. I mean, he really he also realizes, you know, Microsoft succeeds to the degree that Facebook and Google fail, and Amazon fail. And so, privacy is good for Microsoft. It's good for Apple. Um, and it just maybe it's a side effect that it's good for the rest of us too. It's good for business. Let's put it that we'll way. We'll take it. We'll yeah. take it. And let's be honest, it's been a it's been a privacy free for all for the internet for the past, you know, 20 years. I mean, the, the you know, these entire companies like YouTube and and AdSense and everything that Google runs uh, and Facebook and and everyone. I mean, it's all been based on our user information and Apple has kind of latched into that and realized that, you know, they sell a lot of products that, uh, you know, don't necessarily rely on our personal data and the stuff that does, you know, like Apple news and stuff, they personalize on a, on a device basis. So, um, they found a spot that they can really kind of burrow into and consumers like it because it is, you know, when, you, when I use an iPhone, I do feel like the stuff I do on there is is not leaving into a million different trackers. And, you know, whereas on Android, it, it definitely feels like it is. And so um, I, I think that there's a, a, a lot of change in store for these big advertising companies uh, and big tech companies because they have to kind of rethink the game because it's not just when you get that message that says, you know, I opened the Wall Street Journal the other day and I got the message that was like, hey, can we... Uh, track you across all of the websites you visit so that we can wow. deliver you better ads. And what I say, I said, no, you got to be crazy to say yes to that. I mean, who, right. who's going to say yes to that? Yeah, that, that happened with me and Venmo. And I was like, Venmo, <laughs> you're, you want to track me across all the websites? I thought I was just using you to do payments person to person, but it turns out that Venmo wants a whole lot more data. So yeah. uh, I know the big headline is, is Apple versus Facebook as it should be. Um, but I think one of the cool side effects of this is we're going to start to see, you know, how many apps are out there really tracking uh, and have been tracking for a long time. And by the way, they track on the iPhone. So, right. uh, you know, I think Apple is starting to now catch up to some of its rhetoric. You know, what happens on the iPhone stays on the iPhone. Well, really, that's not really the case because they have the store that enables you to download apps yeah. to track you uh, and, and go elsewhere. So, you know, now they're starting their actions are starting to catch up with their marketing. And I think that's good. Uh, Apple apparently has some sort of uh, flock style segment thing it does with audiences too. Apple is not completely out of the tracking business, but it's poorly documented. No, we're not really sure what it does. And that's the, the downside of Apple being kind of, uh, you know, so secretive and closed off and proprietary. We don't really know for a fact that Apple's not tracking us. In fact, there's some evidence they are. Well, okay. And let me, this is, this is fascinating. So, you know, when you look at something like the Apple watch and um, where did I, I saw, anyway, it's one of these things where they know what you're looking at, what you're using on the watch, how you're using the watch, sure. right? Like what, yeah. what apps you use the most, how, you know, even like a, a flow of like, you go from your home screen to the stopwatch to a workout. I mean, there, there's a lot that they do that like you wouldn't really think, um, even though, okay, this is the best example. If you have an iPhone and you have um, Siri suggestions on board, you know, like you have the widget mm -hmm, with Siri, just mm -hmm. put it on your home screen or put it on a screen for a little bit. And I'm not kidding because I dial the same two phone numbers every morning for KTLA um, to do, you know, to set up my live shot. And so every morning, as soon as I put in my headphones, it says, oh, do you want to dial this first yeah, number? Because you say, always do. Wow. So it's right. Because <laughs> yeah. I always do. And then it says, as soon as I disconnect that call, it says, do you want to dial this number? And I say, wow, of course. And then it says, do you want to check your Facebook? Because that's what you typically do after this. I mean, so <laughs> the fact is, that, you know, and this may not leave your phone. Like Apple may argue that that just stays on your phone and that's Siri, you know, smarts. But the reality is that it, it's a little window into just how much these companies know about what we're doing and the and the patterns and trends that they can extrapolate in a million different ways and but, if it's a company like facebook they've you know they're doing it for real 
it, I guess it's to whose benefit. So Apple would say, well, we're doing this for you, Rich. We're not doing it for third-party advertisers. We're doing it for you. So, and we keep it to ourselves. So, okay. Remember, Google tried to do the same thing with the Google Now and Google Cards, and it shut down. I'm not, and I thought, oh, this is going to be great. It's going to know what I do. It's going to tell me ahead of time, you know, oh, don't forget, do this. That's going to be useful. I love that idea. I think probably, I loved it. yeah, people probably didn't like it because they were worried to go what Google was going to do with it. So this is another reason, Alex, why Apple is going to double down on privacy is because they want to do these kinds of things, but they know that if if they're not very clear that they're going to keep it to themselves, people aren't going to aren't going to play along. Yeah, so that's definitely a big move. Um, I think my, my comment earlier um, about glossing over at their products, uh, that, I think that stands because oh, yeah. you know, they're, 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 they're innovating at the margins. And I know like they've just introduced these this you know this important chip, um, but I, I don't think making your computer faster changes your life. Uh, and, and Apple, I mean, it's tough to expect a company to make life-changing products over and over and over again, uh, but Apple has. And... Um, yeah, I'm just wondering, you know, are these going to become kind of rote or are we going to continue to start to see, uh, you know, the sort of life changing type of invention coming out of that company? You know, we talk a lot about what's going to happen with Apple and AR, what's going to happen with the Apple car. And, you know, I, I don't know, maybe uh, maybe I'm expecting too much out of them, but um, but I don't think so. And and that's why, to me, these these new product releases are kind of you know, fairly run of the mill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's take a little break. Uh, I love it. We got the the anti big tech guy on the author of big technology. His Substack is bigtechnology.substack.com. Alex Kantrowitz, it's great to have you uh, here. Ed Bott, who's been uh, uncharacteristically silent, had nothing to say at all about <laughs> Apple. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you. Ed Bott report from ZDNet, and of course Rich Demuro, Rich on Tech TV KTLA's. Do they say that? K do they still say that KTLA's Rich Demuro. Yeah, yeah, sure. KTLA is rich tomorrow. It's great to have all three of you. Uh, more coming up in just a little bit, but first a word from IT Pro TV. Whether you run a business or you're looking to get a job in IT, you know, you got to stay up to date on the latest trends. I mean, this is a this that's one of the things we love about this. This constantly changing uh, area in IT. If you've got an IT team and you want them to be ready for any challenge, keep them up to date keep their skills up to date from with it pro tv not only can you get your team the most recent certificates and training in it you can make sure they stay on track with content they enjoy watching it's not a chore to watch it pro tv they've got very smart best trainers who are able to make it engaging and exciting and interesting their passion for the field is communicated and, and keeps you interested, keeps you passionate. Uh, if you've got the team training portal, you're going to love this. They call it the pro portal. You'll be able to track your team's results, prove the ROI of your training spend. You can manage your seats, assign and unassign team members, access monthly usage reports. You'll get metrics like logins, viewing time, courses viewed, tracks completed, and more. It makes it very easy to manage your teams. You can even create subsets of teams, giving everybody customized assignments, monitoring progress as a group, as an individual, reporting on the usage of the platform. And and I love it because IT Pro TV has a ton of content. I mean, they, they've got now, <laughs> it's kind of amazing, seven studios running all day, Monday through Friday, creating the latest content because stuff's always changing. But what's great about the team platform is you can assign even just a little individual episode within a course as well as full courses. So if somebody needs to polish up a particular skill, you could say, hey, you should watch this. And you can download the data in a CSV, so you can, you know, if you've got more advanced reporting needs, you can incorporate into that. Immediate insight into your team's viewing patterns and progress over any period of time. And the ports, by the way, are visual. They're easy to see, easy to read. They're updated weekly, monthly, and quarterly. You can even get email alerts. So a great solution for anybody who wants to keep a team tip-top and connected. And, of course, any individual who wants to learn the skills you need to get that first job in IT, get those certs, or you're already in IT and you just want to learn more stuff because it's so much fun. This month is Linux month. Yay. Two Linux-related uh, webinars, and uh, they're just wrapping up the Linux-free weekend. It's not too late, though, April 17th and 18th. 
Uh, if it, and by the way, those Linux-related webinars will be there on demand as well. If you've been checking out IT Pro TV's podcast Technado with Don Pazette, they're celebrating their 200th episode, April 22nd. Uh, wow, that's exciting. 200th episode this week. They'll be doing a live show and giveaways. Learning IT, getting a certain IT, getting that team up to speed, there is no better place than IT Pro TV. Go to itpro.tv slash twit. The offer code is twit30. You'll get 30% off all consumer subscriptions as long as you stay active. So that could be forever. itpro.tv slash twit. Use the code twit30 at checkout. IT Pro TV. Build or expand your IT career and enjoy the journey. I've known these guys since they started the company. And, uh, and I'm a huge fan. We've been out there to Gainesville, Lisa and I, to see the facility. Can you believe they have seven studios now? Man. ITPro.tv slash twit. Um, we actually, there are some, we have been able to kind of peek behind the curtain at some Apple stuff. Just a couple more Apple stories just uh, real quickly. Uh, one, uh, Apple Music has revealed how much they pay per stream. And this is really a, a, <laughs> a shot against Spotify and the other streamers. Apple told artists, uh, they sent a letter, that they pay a penny a stream, which is about 10 times what some other streaming services pay, double what Spotify pays per stream. Spotify uh, pays an average about a third to a half penny per stream. Uh, of course, Spotify's got a bigger user base, so a hit on Spotify is going to generate a lot more streams. Uh, but Apple, uh, Apple wants musicians to understand to think anyway. This is another one. This is marketing again. Exactly. <laughs> to think anyway that Apple loves them. Any thoughts? If Taylor Swift well, were I, here, what I, would she say? I, you know, I, I thought there are several good analyses of, of that that I read this week, but it's basically taking um, one set of numbers and comparing them to a completely different oh. set of numbers. I won't say apples and oranges, but, you know. The, <laughs> apples and Spotify. And, 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 and um, you know, Spotify has free plays. Apple doesn't, you know, for example. Um, and, you know, just a, just a, a much huger base. I, and, you know, Apple is completely non-transparent about the way that it compensates uh, artists. Uh, it, it mushed together the payments that it makes to labels and artists there, but then the, uh, the compliant press picked it up and just interpreted that as all this money going to artists. And if you talk to artists, they will tell you that no, they don't get all that money. So, you know, the whole thing struck me as um, one of the, one of the, less seemly examples of of apple pr uh trying to you know to trying to distort its competitive position i i didn't uh, it, it made me clench my teeth <laughs> <laughs> variety <laughs> variety's headline why it's misleading to say apple music pays twice as much per stream uh as spotify um who was was that letter for artists or was it but did Apple hope it would leak and uh, and get picked up by the Wall Street Journal as it did? Are they? In there's other no words, who are they trying to snow? There's no question that they. In fact, I don't think they hoped that it would leak. It they probably they leaked. Probably it. managed <laughs> the, the probably, leak. Yeah. I mean, there's, okay. there's, oh, yeah. there's there is nothing. There, if something leaks from Apple and it's not supposed to leak from Apple, then you know, then then you have lawsuits and stuff. But stuff leaks from Apple all the time, and this this has all the hallmarks of a deliberate leak with uh, PR uh, intent behind it. Yeah, a plant, not a leak. And the journal has always right. has often been complicit in those. And let's not forget the the war between you know Spotify and Apple. I mean that's another you know oh, that's, Alex this is a shot talking about it. Yeah, but you know I mean why is why is Spotify the most popular music service in the world not on the Apple Watch? It makes zero sense. The Apple Watch has been out for five years. It there's no way that that Spotify can't come up with an app that works on the watch. So 
I, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot going on here. There just is. And, you know, it, it's some, it's more than uh, meets the eye and little stories like this make people feel good about Apple. And, you know, I'm sure, yeah, they, they probably do pay a little bit more, who knows, but the reality is there's many more moving parts. I'm sure uh, every artist out there would rather have Spotify on people's wrists right now than two cents from uh, a stream on Apple music. Yeah, and you can't set uh, Spotify as the default on Siri, or at least right. you haven't been able to so for a long time. Yeah. Why is that? Uh, yeah. It's not because Apple customers don't like Spotify. Right. Uh, I mean, it, we, did, we did finally get defaults for um, browsers and mail, and I can't believe it. I mean, I never thought I would see that in my lifetime. I mean, which is funny because if you think about every computer in the world, you know, you're able to set your defaults, you know, even on Android forever. Um, Apple Maps still, if you, you know, if you have an Apple Watch you're, you're, or your, you know, any sort of voice command is still going to go to Apple Maps. Um, and music, you know, is still right now. I mean, you could say play something on Spotify, but nobody does that. I mean, who, who, it's tough enough to learn these, you know, commands to, you know, and then to, to verify, you know, whatever, to explain them even further is even tougher. Yeah. Well, all right, let's spread the hate a little bit. Google. <laughs> <laughs> Next victim. Next victim. Google has uh, once again uh, utilized the double Irish and uh, moved $75 billion. Actually, they did it in 2019, but we're just now learning. Moved $75 billion in profits through Ireland using the uh, the traditional double Irish. Um, does this have the Bermuda reach around in this one? I don't know. But uh, in, in other words, avoiding tax by uh, offshoring profits is a longstanding thing. I thought you couldn't do that anymore. Is that still legal? They did it in 2019. No yeah. Um, oh, they, did, I mean, use the, they did use the Bermuda reach around. <laughs> Uh, that okay. so bad. it does sound bad. I don't. I think I made that uh, up. And with it, there was the double, the double Irish, the double Dutch. They apparently Burm the the company Google Ireland Holdings is registered in Ireland, but for the purposes of paying tax, domiciled in Bermuda. Man, you know, look, it's obviously legal. They wouldn't do it. Uh, you know, if you if you uh, if you confront these guys with it, they said, "Well, we're we're just doing what the law allows us." You should talk to Congress, but of course, uh, Congress writes the laws because Google tells them to. So, anyway, just I thought I'd spread the hate a little extra, just going around. Yeah, I, I you know, that uh, logic to go speak to Congress to me just it gets me every time because you're right, Leo. There are a lot of you know different influence campaigns, whether it's lobby money. You know, they these companies fund like every uh, think tank out in Washington. I mean, maybe not yeah. everyone, but well, and many of these laws are written by about. lobbyists, literally exactly, written by lobbyists. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so it's like, well, we can't we can't ask, ask Congress, and but that's why people feel like the system is rigged against right. them. Right. You know, you have a common person paying a ton of taxes, and then you have these. You know, big companies paying lobbyists, paying think tanks, they influence what's written, and they write the laws, then they don't pay taxes, and then they just throw their hands up and they say, it's hey, the system. It's the system. And then you wonder why us. people want to bring the system down. Yeah. Uh, Australia continues its attack on Google. The Australian Competition and Consumer Commission says that Google broke the law. Uh, they've been they've been found to have quote partially misled Australian consumers about collecting location data. This actually was a federal court ruling handed down in an action brought by the Consumer Rights Watchdog. Uh, it turns out when you turn off location history on some Android and Pixel phones, the location history is still being collected. You have to turn off location history and web and app activity so google continued to collect location data if web and app activity was on and uh, the justice uh said this was partially partially misleading not sure uh, if if there will be a consequence to google but uh i mean you I know think leo if, this is you're using this, a this phone. is giving me uh deja vu to a uh i think a conversation that we had you and i had probably six or seven years ago now on on this exact same topic and you were saying something 
then that you said just a few minutes ago, which is that, you know, why should I object to this? Because I want Google to make my life better. Yeah. I want yeah. Google to keep I track of location stuff. on. And and my argument was there that um, you're a, you and I come from a position of fairly extreme privilege right. in all of this. And the fact that all of this data is being collected and assembled into not just dossiers, but the, the raw material for dossiers that can be built on the fly at any time. And it just has the potential to impact all kinds of people who don't have the kind of privilege that we do. So right. things like redlining, things like credit decisions, things like, you know, you you walked into this store, you, you know, and this store, it's a it's a payday loan shop. Um, boom, you can't get a loan anymore. And that's in your location history. Right. And and you know, and it doesn't matter that you walked in there because does you that, were does that a actual is company. there evidence that, that actually happens or is that a perspective harm? Well, there's no, all of this stuff is so um, poorly documented, uh, but we there just don't is, know, there, in other words. There has, in fact, been evidence of decisions like this being made. And you can guarantee that every credit agency in the world would do this yeah. if they could. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And not just credit, but I mean, it, you know, uh, insurance companies, let's say that. You know, Google knows when you're speeding. I mean, let's be honest. They see your location changing and their algorithm could figure out exactly how fast you're going. And I'm not saying they're doing that, but if they wanted to, that's something they could easily do. And let's say they sold that money to insurance companies and then they, you know, and then they, uh, you know, cross-referenced it against the, the people they insure. And they say, Rich, we've noticed that uh, you like to go 90 in a 70. And so we're going to raise your rates. And I say, oh, I didn't know my phone was doing this. And it's just the reality of like, we don't know what's happening here with this data and we don't know until we do know. And I think that's the scary part is that like what Ed was saying with these, you know, the stores you go to, there's a, a startup out there that's going to say, oh, we can figure out someone's credit profile based on where they shop. They go to a liquor store every day or a Target or a, you know, Home Depot. We can figure out what kind of credit profile they have based on that and our smart algorithms. And so- Or, or Dollar General, could it happen? for example, you know. What's that? Or, or Dollar General, uh, for example, you know, which you can you can take you can segment um, retail behavior. Uh, but we've been you know, able into to do that buckets. for years. I mean, uh, I remember thirty years ago, a guy coming in saying, "Well, tell me your zip code. I could tell you what magazines you subscribe to." I mean, that that always right. has happened, right? <laughs> but it, yeah, and it was and it was horrible. I mean, it didn't work very well. That was literally the basis of redlining. Yeah, that was yeah, literally yeah. the basis of redlining. Oh, it was horrible. Well, yeah. So what do we want to do? We want what, what's the solution uh, to this? And maybe I mean that's why Apple's saying, "Hey, look, we may give you that. We may keep track of what phone calls Rich Tomorrow makes every morning, but we don't tell anybody." Would you be willing to use a solution like that, Ed? You got an iPhone, I guess you are. You know, probably, uh, certainly, uh, but. Even though the, we really don't know what Apple shares, we, could, we it's it's right, and and the real the answer is not to come up with more rules and uh, and more regulation. It's to come up with more transparency. Yeah, and I, that's, that's I agree the other thing. You. Apple yeah. by by putting all this emphasis on privacy, we're letting them write the rules. You know, and and you know, and all these companies that. You know, it, is there anything really that's, uh, you know, the, the Europe was pretty big about all the regulations with privacy, but like in America, it's still pretty wide open to what is allowed and, um, you know, available to people. And, and and I'm not saying, you know, like, look, these are just new companies that are doing this, like the Googles of the world. But Leo, to your point, yeah, this tracking has been going on forever. Like, and I think Alex, someone said credit cards. I mean, if you don't think that Chase is analyzing every single transaction that you make and creating a profile that they then sell your data uh, against something else, and then that shows up as an ad somewhere. I mean, this is all happening. I mean, it's it's all happening. This well, stuff welcome you, to America. You know, why do you think I every mean, company that's... wants you to... We're you know, in a capitalist a society. This is this is the nature. The club cards. I, I mean, mean, those are tracking if you. I the grocery had, store. They, if I had know. my druthers, everything would be open source and non-proprietary, but that's not... We live in a capitalist society. This is the way stuff is. I don't know what you... Do you want government to somehow figure out a way to, to 
stop this? I don't know, because that's that's given us that little cookie uh, cookie pop up yeah, on every I, website we go to. Yeah. So I don't know if I want that. You know, well, I mean, that's that, when we talk about we talk about the market, though. Like this is kind of you know, I, I guess this is the moment in the conversation where I take back all the negative things I've said about Apple. No, I'm just kidding, <laughs> uh, Leo. When you call me the anti big tech guy, I mean, I'm anti the BS, but you know. Some things that big tech do is good. We love big and, tech. And That's where this yeah. is. Where this is really fundamentally what's stuff. driving everything I do. I is it a yeah. is it a admiration, a love, and a fascination by technology with technology. Exactly. Yeah. And I think we need to like draw the distinction. Like there are going to be companies. We we get to choose. You know, ultimately, you know, where we shop or what we buy, and there are trade offs involved. Well, good luck finding a company that doesn't track stuff. you. No, of course. But like when it comes to devices, because we're talking about Google here, like ultimately it's a decision between, do you want to buy a device where you are the user and you are the customer? Right. It's Apple, right? You use the products, you're the customer. Or do you want to buy the device where you're the user and somebody else is the customer? Right. And that's a Google device. You know, you're using it, but the customer at the end of the day for Google is advertisers, not the people buying right. Right. the phone are not the companies that are using Android because Android's open source. So it's not like Google's making a ton of money that way. Uh, and I think that when we when we do engage with technology, when we buy devices, things like that, you know, this is a distinction that we should start drawing. Maybe people already are. You know, am I going to be the user and the customer or am I going to be the user and somebody else will be the customer, in which case they're buying me? What do you guys think of Flock? What do you? Let's start with you, Ed. What do you think of Flock? This is Google's Google's saying, all right, we're going to turn off the third-party tracking cookie. We're going to stop tracking you. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to, in browser, not off browser, but in your browser, we're going to look at all the places you visit, and we're going to put you in a cohort um, you know, um, old white men for me, I guess. I don't know. Old white podcasters. Uh, I don't, I don't know. Howdy neighbor. <laughs> we don't, we don't really know yet what those cohorts are. We don't know how big they are. Uh, it's all kind of a work in progress or Google's being a, a obscure, probably a little bit of both. Is this a, a, a Google's attempt is to, uh, you know, give advertisers some information, uh, without, specific tracking there have been some complaints eff says well it's just another data point that'll allow companies to fingerprint you because oh and here's the other thing about flock which is wild after google analyzes your behavior puts you in a segment then a little bit of javascript any site you go to can query oh what segment is this guy in so you're basically your browser, and right now it's only Chrome because every other browser has said, there's no way we're doing this. None of the Chromium browsers, Edge or Brave or, or anybody. Uh, or Vivaldi. Want, Vivaldi. Yeah. They're, not a, they're, they're all yep. taking that flock code out. But Google, if you use Chrome, which is the like 90% browser, uh, huge dominance. If you use Chrome, any site that asks, Google will say, oh, yeah, you know, this guy's segment 53B. Um, is is that? I mean, this strikes me. This strikes me as a lot of hand waving from Google, and also a way of dealing with, uh, of basically trying to end up at a midpoint that is still economically advantageous to them, uh, in a way that you know, if 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 they lose all ability to track, then you know, their, their economic model, their business model collapses. So this is their, um, this does is sort of though, their fallback position. Can't they, I mean, honestly, does it? So the number one way Google makes money, I th I'm pretty sure, maybe Alex, you know better, but uh, I'm pretty sure is in search and selling uh, search terms. So they have auctioned a very successful uh, technique and there's maybe a little self-dealing on that. We'll talk about that in a bit, but they have an auction for keywords. You buy the keyword uh, and then when somebody searches for something and that keyword shows up, your ad shows up. That's the, I think by far the most profitable thing Google does. That and it doesn't involve tracking at all. If I search, uh, you know, for cargo pants, um, and the Gap has bought that keyword, I'm going to see that ad. That's not tracking me. That's just responding to my search term. It, even if it's sixty percent. Of their they revenue. don't want to lose There's 40. still another, yeah. There, yeah. Well, yeah. And so another 12% of it is, you know, hardware and G Suite and stuff like that. But they're still, they're still up in the 80% that's totally based on, on advertising. And I, I do not believe that the marketplace for search advertising is completely keyword driven and that there's no other signals that are integrated into that. That would make, 
that would make no sense, uh, you know, for the way, that, the way that Google that was operates. The case. Well, you could definitely segment that stuff. But, uh, you know, I, I think that let's take, let's just kind of unpack this from, from Google's side here. Uh, if you gave me a, or from a consumer standpoint, uh, which maybe maybe are aligned. If you gave me the option to be tracked one to one, right? So a marketer follows me around the web with a cookie, and knows exactly what I do, and can pretty easily de-identify me, you know, because we know that this whole anonymous tracking thing is often uh, a lie. Uh, and instead, I'm placed in a cohort of a dozen or twenty people or something like that. So they just track the group behavior on aggregate. I'd be much more comfortable with the cohort and. I don't know, maybe I'm an outlier here, but I do think that like most of the tracking that's done on the web doesn't really add up to all that much. I think it's generally made out to be more than we hear uh, in the common discussion because ads on the web are still pretty terrible. Like, I don't know how often, you know, Facebook, the most egregious tracker of all. I don't know how often I see an ad on, on inside Facebook where I say, you know what, this ad really gets me. How do they I know that? I don't well, use Facebook, but I will I, tell okay. you Instagram's ads work very, very well. And, and as, as well. someone who, you know, deals with the public on TV, I, I get emails every day. I can tell you the products that are being advertised heavily in the tech world. Because uh, that's what on people the ask about. Of, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm talking yeah. these little photo sticks, like all, you know, these Wi-Fi extenders, like the exact brands, the exact apps. I mean, there's an app. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's pretty wild. So the, the advertising... And maybe Alex, that's but against those are, your but point that's because it's yeah. Those are not maybe it's not targeted. Crime. Those it's are like, not targeted. Those are yeah. You know, I get well, that's and they're crap ads. And I would prefer mm -hmm. if I were being targeted, they would say, "Oh well, you know what you're doing, so we're not going to serve you those crap ads." Here, have some fine non-crap ads. Yeah, and I would say I mean, here's the thing: like in, in a perfect stuff. world, it works because yeah. you know, let's say you're interested in a company, right? You, uh, you know, athletic wear. I was looking up this morning this uh, you know athletic brand. And, you know, I look at the website, I go, okay, cool, 50 bucks for a pair of shorts, whatever, not going to buy. Now, all of a sudden, I'm scrolling Instagram and it says, hey, get your first pair of shorts for 50% uh, off. And I said, okay, cool. Now, I think in that case, it does work. And would I rather see that than some random ad for something? Probably. Um, so, I think that so this Rich, idea just of the target- more. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know- I, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, I'm kind of, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't hate the tracking. I think that there's, um, you know, I think there's a time and place for it. And I think that, uh, like you said, like these Facebook is the master marketer and still the ads I've always seen on there are terrible. So, so I don't, but, you know, but, maybe but it doesn't work. Am I wrong? It strikes me. And maybe because Instagram is a sealed box, it's from Facebook, but I, I suspect that the Instagram ads I see are directly connected to the Instagram people I follow and and other behaviors on Instagram, but they're shockingly good. Those clearly know me well, and and of course, one of the things they do on Instagram is you know they sell T-shirts that have your age, your town in the T-shirt, right? You've seen those, right? It's like, no. yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like I love Petaluma. I see ads that say I love because I know that there that ad is so tight, highly targeted. That's got my age, you know. 64 ain't that old or something and 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 that's like my god they know who i am yeah but by the way by the time you get into one of these cohorts that whole situation is gone because they now are tracking you instead of one to one as a group of people so you know they wouldn't be like i love yeah. petaluma you know they no. you could end up being with a whole group of I, others i have so mixed feelings sort of about california yeah. it'll, it'll be like yeah. back to the future or it'll i love change. california right texas <laughs> florida london you know costa rica like 64 and the czech becomes republic. like <laughs> yeah just over the hill yeah, maybe one of these how so. do i get the czech republic cohort that's what i want yeah know. exactly well you're with one person and yeah. then all of a sudden the marketer well so, so like which the is where can use that to target but then back into convert and decide which to double down on. Which is so, worse. So you you prefer the cohort idea. I mean, uh, if you're a privacy advocate, the cohort sounds better. If you like to get ads that know what you're doing and make you think that Facebook is listening to you, you probably want to be tracked one-to-one. -one. Right. I think it's a matter of personal preference here. So, well, that's you know, why I like again, the Apple. Deciding. That's why I like yeah. Apple giving you the choice and says, pops up, says, you want to be tracked? Um, and more and more you're seeing that. I think one thing that's very clear is that consumers have, are voting with their feet. They're saying, we do not want to be tracked. Uh, in fact, that's why these browsers are not going to and do flock. And I wonder if this is going to hurt Chrome's uh, market share. I mean, I, I think more and more normal people, the people who watch 
Rich on TV or listen to me on the radio, I think more and more normal people are aware of this and are responding to it. No doubt. But let's say you use one of those other browsers. Do you then end up in a one-to-one -one or a group, a cohort oh, yeah, tracking you might, you, yeah, situation? That's a good point. So you might yeah. end up being on Google you're more might be making the bet yeah. that you will you will vote with your feet. I mean, honestly, if you're using a Google product, you're never going to win on privacy because it's Google. But right. uh, at the end of the day, that would be their pitch. Let me take a little break. I want to talk about Amazon. Jeff Bezos' his last letter as CEO says, we have to do better. Oh, and by the way, Elon Musk beat Jeff Bezos in the space race on Friday with a big decision from NASA. We'll talk about that, too. Our show today brought to you by Worldwide Technology and Cisco. WWT has spent the last couple of decades building knowledge, building expertise to help enterprise companies do a better job with technology. And I think there's one area that you really need to know about WWT, and, and that's security. That has become job one for every company in the world. WWT offers security solutions and services to protect your business. I mean, you know, we know, attackers are updating their strategy daily. Are you? Well, you can with the help of WWT. They'll help you prepare for and combat the next gen threats. This is a company with the vision, the services, the capabilities, the, the dedication to deliver the security controls and reduce the risks for your organization. They worked with a retail bank. Retail bank really wanted to establish an infrastructure that could prevent, and, and failing that, survive a cyber security event, a catastrophic event like ransomware. WWT helped them reduce system outages by 40% and gave them a cost savings of 48% through infrastructure automation. Whether it's risk management, endpoint security, network security, identity and access management, cloud security, WWT has the expertise, the skills, the depth of knowledge to help your business. See how both WWT and Cisco can protect your business assets and intellectual property with a holistic security approach. Go to WWT.com slash twit to get started. Let worldwide technology help you. WWT.com slash to it we thank them so much for their support wwt make a new world happen wwt.com slash twit the uh, jeff bezos uh retiring stepping down as ceo he's gonna uh, uh gonna be the uh, chairman of the board but less focused on day to day operations he's handing over the the reins to andy jassy um <laughs> He's kind of maybe this is another one of the it, it seems like the whole show's been about corporate spin and PR um, uh -huh. and maybe this is more of the same in the letter he says um, if you've read some of the news reports you might think we don't care about our employees <laughs> <laughs> well we do <laughs> but maybe we ought to do better he's coming off a victory of course the Alabama uh, warehouses uh, voted against the union, fairly substantially voted against the union. Um, he says, while voting results were lopsided and our direct relationship with employees is strong, it's clear to me we need a better vision for how we create value from employees, a vision for their success. Um, I'm sure Amazon will continue to fight unions, uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, there are things they can do to make it better to work at Amazon. He said, our employees are sometimes accused of being desperate souls and treated as robots. <laughs> That's not accurate. Remember the, uh, was it a book that said that uh, if you didn't cry at your desk once a day at Amazon, you really weren't <laughs> working hard enough? <laughs> um If any shareholder shareholders are concerned that Earth's best employer... And Earth's safest place to work, that's his goal, might dilute our focus on Earth's most, most customer-centric company. Let me set your mind at ease. Think of it this way. If we can operate two businesses as different as consumer e-commerce and Amazon Web Services and do both at the highest level, we can certainly do the same with these two vision statements. I'm comp confident they will reinforce each other. Spin, or do you think he genuinely is... Uh, uh, being, you know, a little affected by uh, all of the blowback and wants to do something to make it a better company. 
Well, this is Jeff Bezos' last letter to shareholders as CEO. So what he's thinking when he's writing this is legacy, legacy, legacy. And for him, he's reading the news and he's seeing, you know, what happened with the high profile Twitter battle that leaded, that led uh, employees to end up like sharing photos of them, the bottles that they've peed in and letters telling them to stop pooping in bags with the press, which basically like, you know, Amazon is, is under fire and for the way that it treats employees. And it's becoming, it's on its way to becoming the be the biggest employer in the U.S. Uh, it's added a million employees uh, in wow. under a decade. Wow. Uh, and, and it just keeps adding 100,000, 200,000 a year. And so this is going to be Jeff Bezos' legacy because at the end of the day, you know, he's going to be the person who's going to be responsible for the state of the American worker uh, because the American worker is largely moving from places like the factory, uh, which produce things, to places like the fulfillment center, which, distrib with, which distributes things. And so Bezos is going to, you know, this stuff is going to continue to grow. Amazon added 50 million Prime members in the last year, up from 150 million. That's so stunning. 33% growth. First time we've ever year. heard that number, by the way, 200 yeah, million exactly. Amazon Prime subscribers. Yeah. So so I think Bezos is thinking, you know, when, when people look back at him, they're going to look back at the e-commerce company he built, but they'll also look at the broader transformation that he led in terms of the economy and the way that work is structured. And of course, there were other factors that were involved there. And so that's why I think we heard so much about the worker there. And now, does Amazon care? Yeah, actually, I think Amazon cares a lot more than um, we end up hearing in the press reports. I don't think it's a miserable place for so many people to work. It can be really tough. Um, but uh, I do think that the reality there is somewhere in between uh, what we hear in some of like the worst. It's not like everybody goes in and brings their bottle to work, you know, and pees in it twice a day. Um, you know, there are, there are good jobs at Amazon, um, but but they definitely have room to improve. And I kind of, you know, the 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 um, Amazon was freaking out when people were talking about the way that their employees are treated. Um, and, and, you know, there is some righteous indignation that they can have. The United States politicians are the ones that signed trade deals like NAFTA and encouraged China to join the WTO, which ended up having us trade those production jobs with women jobs. And Amazon, uh, you know, pays $15 minimum wage, where the federal government has a $7.25 minimum wage. And so, you know, I kind of see Amazon's side a little bit when, you know, they're they're looking at these, you know, politicians from the U.S. government saying, you got to treat workers better. And Amazon's like, you're supposed to be looking after the workers. In America, you're, I mean, of course, Amazon, we talked about, has lobbyists, but... You know, th there have been decades where our politicians have had a chance to make the situation better, and they failed. Uh, you can also make the case that, that voting down the union in Alabama was a, was a vote of confidence from the workers, saying we prefer Amazon management, we don't need a union. I, yeah, I'd buy that more if um, if Amazon didn't go through the painstaking union-busting process that it did. If Amazon had that vote be, you know, let, let that vote, vote be fair, and didn't like compel people to go into education systems and you know start like getting the post office to like have this mailbox in that you know might have made some people think that they were going to read their ballots right. uh, that might be one thing i mean why do you, if if you really think that you can stand up based off of the merits you don't need to bring the union busting firm in you obviously have a right to defend yourself against unionization if you don't want it but to just go through such effort and to be so against it like i don't think this was you know, entirely the workers standing up and saying, we don't want a union. Obviously, Amazon had a role in it. And Amazon's like, this wasn't a victory for us. It's what the workers wanted. But Amazon corporate, it was definitely a victory for them. They had a side. They picked a side. They pushed it real hard. And then we saw the impact of it. It's an interesting goal to become Earth's best employer and Earth's safest place to work. Um, a lot of this letter was talking about how we already are great. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what he plans to do to make it the best employer and the safest place uh, to work. Um, well, there's, there's a couple things, a couple things here. Number one, uh, uh, Bezos is doing what Bill Gates did 15 years ago. And uh, Andrew Carnegie did before him, right? And Andrew Carnegie did back in a, you know, many, several generations ago. Um, and so, and, and people were skeptical about Bill Gates, uh, walking away from a day-to-day -day role with Microsoft, and yet that's exactly what he did, Bill and became a philanthropist. One of has, the has really become yeah, the, yeah. the you know his his primary focus there. So and so like, that's, and you know, I guess like Andrew Carnegie, some of that was to renovate his reputation. To yeah, I think to a large extent, but there was also uh, I, I think people who know Bill 
will say that there was some genuine personal transformation that, um, that happened along the way. But I think the other thing about the, the, you know, the whole union vote, um, there's two factors there that we really need to keep in mind. Um, one is that this vote took place in probably, you know, perhaps the worst possible place to have a union vote. It's this is one of a, the reddest states in the country. The, yeah. One of the reddest yeah. states with one of the most most powerful so-called right to work traditions. Right. I, you know, I just I just get angry when I use when I have to use the phrase right to work because it's the exact opposite of of what it should be. You know, but it's but right now. Uh, the United States is one of the most anti-union countries in the world. And so basically, Bezos is operating as the kinder, gentler face of what every corporation is doing. They don't have to bust unions anymore. The unions are 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 in uh, shambles. They're in they're in shards on the on the ground. And and so you know, and and with an NLRB that isn't able to really influence the course of the election very much, this one seemed kind of kind of preordained. I, you know, uh, you know, the, it's a it's a country that's anti-union. It's a state that's aggressively red and and anti-union. So I guess this didn't surprise me at all. And for Bezos to come back and say, well, thank goodness that our employees love us so much. No, I don't think that's what it means. He quoted 94 percent of our employees say they would recommend Amazon as a to a friend as a place to work. He says we want to make that 100 percent, but 94 is not bad. This is well, it's it, better than Wendy's. <laughs> well, and it pays better than Wendy's, I might add, and pays better than Walmart, I might add. Um, yeah. There are plenty of. Yeah, and at the end of the day, like the workers did vote. You know, yeah. they did get to vote. They got to so vote. I can't discount their their choices, do, even do though Amazon influenced. Do you think this is uh, this is Jeff Bezos's? Um, uh, it's, it's his farewell. Do you think this is his attempt to kind of leave on a high note and and uh, and 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 then just kind of wash walk away, wash his hands of the whole thing? How, how well will Amazon do without Jeff Bezos at the helm? He, there's, I think, for whatever you, you don't like about him, you have to say strategically, he is a he's amazing, right? I mean, he's brilliant. Or no? I mean, the culture. Go ahead, Alex. You first. I, I would just say that the culture that he's built, uh, when you start to look at it up front, and you know, of course, there's an element of how workers are treated. I think it could be better. Um, I think there's a big the difference between way... the, the experience in the warehouse and the experience in the uh, in the executive suite, right? I mean, they're no two doubt. different yeah. jobs, very different but jobs. No doubt, no doubt. But there are some some constants where, like you, both of those, both workers in the fulfillment centers and workers in the um, in the corporate offices can have their jobs automated away, right? Uh, and we'll have to adjust. And in fact, this past week on Big Technology Podcast, I had. Uh, one of the uh, people who worked in Amazon's corporate office is a woman named Elaine Kwan, who had her her uh, her job automated away. She was on the phone with Gucci and Versace, stocking the fulfillment centers, and then all of a sudden that was handed over to machine learning. So it's uh, you know everybody inside that company needs to be able to adapt and embrace change. Um, and you look at most big companies and they just kind of make something and they stop. Like this was the case with Microsoft for a long time. Uh, where they made Windows, they were the desktop operating system, uh, and and they stopped. And only after we moved to mobile and and the cloud did they actually have to catch up. And they've done a good job, uh, although they were pretty late to the game. Uh, but you look at Amazon, and they're always one step ahead of what's going on. You know, bookstore, then selling everyone through a first party marketplace to build a third party marketplace. Logistics and fulfillment, voice computing, hardware manufacturing with something like the Kindle, not to mention the fact that they are a grocer and Academy Award winning movie studio. And now they're moving into healthcare. And you don't excel at all that stuff unless your culture, your leadership, and your processes and internal technology are locked in. And I don't think there's anybody on the planet right now that's done a better job at that than Bezos. So I think the company will be able to survive. And the big question is whether they're going to be able to keep that mentality that Bezos has instilled you know, from his position at the top uh, after he leaves. Jesse, of course, has shadowed him uh, as his technical advisor back in the day before he built AWS. He's done a good job with AWS, built it into a massive business. Uh, but you never quite know until the person at the top leaves. And we know with Microsoft, Bill Gates left and they put Steve Ballmer in. 
uh, who was just there to, you know, ended up making money um, and they needed to make another leadership change to get mm-hmm. back, you know, to their more inventive ways. So that'll be a question with Amazon. But I think Bezos's legacy as somebody who is who, who's been able to build a powerhouse company, I don't think that's ever going to, uh, you know, go into question in the long term. Ed, do you think Amazon will do as well with Andy Jassy as Microsoft did with Steve Ballmer? <laughs> sure. And, and, you know, Ballmer gets a, uh, Ballmer gets a bum rap a lot because, uh, he, he, you know, cheerleader extraordinaire developers, 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 yeah. developers, developers, developers. And he also made the, he made, uh, two really bad bets. He made a bet on advertising that didn't pan Overture. out and he made a bet on mobile Nokia. that didn't pan out, but they were both very sensible bets uh, logical and and the fact that they didn't turn out had more to do with external uh, market forces than anything else. But he also, in the background, was building the cloud infrastructure that became Azure, that became the basis for Office 365 and then Microsoft 365. And all of that stuff was with Satya Nadella, who was reporting directly to him, who was building all of that stuff under under Balmer's leadership. I think ultimately when you go back to it, what happened is that Microsoft as a company was built to do a specific thing, to grow, you know, to, to find an area of technology and just grow it relentlessly. And I think Amazon is the same thing. Uh, it's a company that was built to squeeze margin out of everything, to become more efficient at everything. And so everything that they've gotten into, that was an impressive list that Alex, uh, you know, spooled out there. And, 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 and the, whole, the, the, uh, the defining characteristic of all of those things is that each one of them, they're extremely efficient and, and extremely uh, market focused. And that's the kind of company that they built. That's the kind of people they hired. So, you know, it's a, it's a juggernaut. It's just going to keep on. It's just going to keep on moving. And if it if it falls apart, it will fall apart years from now. Um, you know, not in the next two or three years, because that's 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 not what happens to juggernauts. Yeah. It, he's, it, Jeff's given it some good DNA, I think. Uh, I think no- you're right that he's sorry. I think you're right that he's getting out at the right time, though. Uh, oh yeah, because you do have congressional uh, yeah, investigation. The FTC is looking into FTC, them. You know, the Congress yeah. is going to pass yeah. new laws. Lena Khan, who wrote about like how Amazon needs to have stricter antitrust uh, regulation, is now on her way to the FTC. So, you know, uh, Bezos might have seen all that coming and said, you know what, now's a good time for me to think about space. How about space? Space yeah. sounds nice. He also he also has the Washington <laughs> Post. He has a lot of other interests. Yeah. So, um, what do you, what do you think, um, Rich? Uh, you know, I think that uh, I was just kind of thinking what Ed just said about, you know, they squeezed efficiencies out of these, you know, various industries like, you know, they're going into grocery right now and, you right. know, the, everything. And but but every tech company that comes along these days, that's their mission. I mean, they're they're rewriting the book for just about everything that we do in this world. And Amazon was early on that. I mean, they they started with the bookstore and they just continued to disrupt more and more. And I don't see that changing um, anytime soon. When you look at, I, I read a statistic, uh, I don't know, it was last year or something where, you know, Amazon, you think that they're, you know, that you would think that they control everything when it comes to, you know, commerce. And it's just a small fraction still when it comes to what they are able to sell online and how many people they reach. And so I, I you know, even without Bezos uh, on board, I think they're going to, that's probably the worst thing you could say, because I think he is on the board, but he's not at the helm. He's the chairman. Um, no, he is. He's the chairman of the board. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, it, I think that this company yeah. was set up to to disrupt and they, they will continue to do that. But then again, every company that comes along nowadays is disrupting what we knew and, and love. And so, um, I don't know. I, I think that uh, it's a company. It's I'm just thinking about all the things that we've talked about so far. It's in America right now, it's very conflicting because we love Apple, but we hate them. We love Google, yeah. but we hate <laughs> this them. This show is a we love Amazon. example of all that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, we... there. Do you think it's the same people that love and hate, or is it uh, different 
different parties, different. Uh, I think it's both. I think it's both. Like I sit there and I order from Amazon and I, and I order something. And I hate myself. It's, uh, yes. And I, it's a $5 item. And I say, I can't believe someone has to bring this to my house because, <laughs> you know, it saves me $2. Yeah, yeah. But then when I tweet that out, people say, well, look, you know, that, that truck is driving down your street no anyway, matter what, whether they stop there at anyway. your house. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Jeff so actually addresses a lot think. of this in that letter. He talks about that, in fact. Um, it's, it, he makes a strong case for the, the value Amazon has added to the, to the country and uh, to se secondarily the world. One of the things Amazon has never been able to do is uh, make itself a global power uh, to the degree that it wanted to be. It's still, while there's Amazon.ca and Amazon.Australia, it's still really an American company uh, because Asia has got Alibaba and and I don't think I bet you uh, that's one. It, he didn't talk about it, but I bet you that's one area where Bezos felt like maybe he didn't succeed to the degree he wanted to. He talks about being the best company in the world, but it really isn't the world. It's a, it's a smaller smaller part of the world. He says Earth, Earth, which is by you the know. way telling, isn't it? Let's talk about Jeff's space ambitions. We'll do that in uh, just a second. Ed Bot is here from the Ed Bot Report on ZDNet. That's Rich on Tech. Don't confuse the two. I know they're both good-looking fellas. Rich on Tech <laughs> TV, and of course Alex Kantrowitz, who is uh, the uh, guy behind Big Technology, the book, and now the newsletter BigTechnology.substack.com. And there's a Big Technology podcast. That's right. Yeah, we podcast once a week, every Wednesday, a new interview with a Tech Insider or Outside Agitator. That sounded so. interesting. Yeah, I want to. I'm going to go back and listen to that interview with the Amazon. Yeah, you should come on sometime, Leo. Hey, Any time. Just all you have to do is ask. Okay. Uh, all right. Our show today brought to you by... Hey, before we do that, let me show you the... Do we have the promo this week? We didn't have a promo last week. So we've put together the highlights from the week that was. Watch. I'm looking at the salute, the Vulcan salute. There's something different. What it is about that ring finger of yours? After three and a half years of Lori being very patient, we decided that we were going to... Make it official. No Married doubt. man. Yeah, congratulations. Previously on TWIT. TWIT News. Jensen Huang, the founder and CEO of NVIDIA, is going to talk about the areas NVIDIA is uh, is venturing into. I think it's become pretty clear with NVIDIA's growth in not only gaming, but cryptocurrency mining, self-driving vehicles, machine learning. This is a company on the move. Security Now. Cisco has informed the world that it has no plans to fix critical security vulnerabilities affecting some of its small business routers. What does it tell its past customers to do? Replace them with new Cisco devices. You know, or <laughs> perhaps it's time to consider changing brands. All about Android. There's a new heads up feature rolling out for digital well being that will detect when you are using your phone while walking around. So it will notify you to either watch your step, stay alert, or look up. And uh, this will be aimed specifically at those who are walking distractedly. Twit. Watch out, you're about to step into a manhole. Uh, what they left out of that, because we didn't want to tell anybody ahead of time, is that we also this week announced the club twit and we encourage you uh, if you want to support twit and hear ad free versions of our shows go to uh, twit.tv slash club twit you can learn more seven dollars a month for ad free versions a dedicated discord clubhouse and the twit plus feed which will have all sorts of stuff that really isn't good enough to put in the main shows <laughs> the scraps <laughs> our show today brought to you actually some of it's pretty fun our show today is brought to you by podium Think about it. You know, uh, if you get a text message as you leave a, a drugstore, a grocery store, a ice cream shop, or a dentist, you're going to be much more likely to see that than and respond to it than an email that you get days, months, weeks later. That's what Podium does. Podium is the messaging platform you can use to power your business. It helps you reach your customers wherever they are. Business messaging with Podium can be used to get reviews, collect payments, communicate, capture leads. And it all goes into one inbox. Your employees will like that. It makes it very easy. They can even use their own phone's messaging system to respond. Podium lets you adapt to changing customer expectations. And I have to say, I would far rather communicate with a business via text than have to call them. Because it's, it, that's easier for me. 98% of text messages will be opened. Email, 20%. 
That's really all you need to know. In the, in the 90s, your business needed an email address. By the 2000s, you had to have a website. Social media in the 2010s. Well, in the 2020s, your business needs to be texting. And Podium makes it easy. <clears throat> you can, with Podium reviews, for instance, easily text customers as they leave your store. I, it happened to me the other day. I, I was at the dentist's. As I left, they said, hey, leave us a review. That made a big difference. That quick response, a click link, a click in the text, and boom, it's done. Podium web chat on your website lets web chat visitors text with your team right from your homepage. You can use Podium video chat and meet customers directly. Get paid fast with Podium payments. And it all comes together in Podium inbox, which keeps leads warm and responds, lets you respond to feedback all in one place. It's easy to set up Podium. Uh, you know, dentist offices, my ice cream shop, they're always sending me podium messages. It's great. It's a great way to stay in touch with your customers. And you can be onboarded within 24 hours. They've even got a full team in place who can help walk you through the process. Uh, just some examples. America's Car Mart uses podium. They collected 21,000 leads through the podium web chat. TJ, the Guy in charge of digital experience there said, before Podium, we had a contact us form. It might be days before anybody got back to that customer. Now our response time is minutes because you know what? Your employees like using text as much as the rest of us do. Your customers do. RPM Alamo increased business by 20%. We've generated more revenue, says Tony. He's the owner. Decreased vacancy rates and pull in more leads than we could have in multiple years. This is priceless. Podium. This is how your customers want to communicate with you. This is how you want to communicate with your customers. It's, it's a must-have in the 20s. Find out how Podium can help your business reach more customers. Get started free today. Podium, P-O-D-I-U-M dot com slash twit. Podium dot com slash twit. We thank them so much for their support of this week in tech. Friday, late, NASA, big announcement. They're awarding a contract to build the moon lander to SpaceX. Blue Origin had bidded, bidded, bid, had bid, had bid, uh, lost the bid. In fact, uh, I was talking with Rod Pyle, who does our space uh, stuff on the uh, radio show. He said, uh, basically, NASA just didn't have the money to, to go with anybody else, so they went with a low bidder. $2.9 billion to use SpaceX's Starship to take astronauts from lunar orbit to the moon. NASA has a program, the SLS Orion program, which will take the astronauts into orbit. They'll transfer over to the starship and then fly to the moon and land on the moon probably 2025. NASA had uh, accepted proposals from Dynetics, which is a Huntsville, Alabama defense contractor, and Blue Origin, but uh, SpaceX won the bidding uh and this could be very interesting certainly good news for elon musk bad news for jeff bezos who you know has been moving a little bit more slowly with blue origin spacex has been very aggressive uh, with starship one of the things i love the most john you're a space fan you'll probably love this starship is there's no lunar lander <laughs> Starship does. We've we've watched it happen on uh, on Earth. It turns around and lands on the moon. The whole thing, like out of a 1950s sci-fi movie, just lands on the moon. Um, any thoughts? Are you guys excited? Broad said, basically, Where's Richard Branson in all of this. Oh yeah, what didn't he have a space? You're right. Virgin, yeah. Virgin, what is it? Virgin Space? Virgin, yeah, Virgin Galactic. Space. Uh, uh, they're, they're, Galactic, they're, and, Virgin well, Galactic. And the reason I know that is because they're down in southern New Mexico. Ah. That's their... Um, that's they their were base. not in the bidding for it. Um, maybe, yeah. you know, he's going to do commercial um, trips where you go up in a little <laughs> bit in the atmosphere and down, you know, just like... Whoosh, whoosh. Um, so maybe they're just focused. Uh, well, it, this reminds me, you know, the, you know, the meme... With the two Spider Men circling each other, uh, you know, they can't tell which one is uh, yes. which one is which. Watching Be but watching Bezos and Musk uh, taking each other on is like really, you know, it's like two billionaires with their billionaire space companies. Um, I I don't, you know, I I don't really see much of a difference between them in terms of their public profile. Yeah. 
Yeah, but there is a big difference in the aggressiveness, I think, of uh, Musk's SpaceX. Um, Elon is nothing if not aggressive, right? He's uh, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes too much so. There was a horrific Tesla crash in Houston um, this week. Oh, awful. Uh, and I, th I think there's a little bit of, uh, honestly, a little bit of blame to be assigned to Tesla on this. Uh, two passengers were killed in the crash. Um, they were using Tesla's, quote, full self-driving features. One of them was in the back seat. The other was in the passenger seat. They were not driving. The car crashed into a tree, f f drove off the road, crashed into a tree, burst into flames and killed both uh, drivers. And I think there's a little bit of blame, honestly, uh, on Tesla on this. Because they really promote this full self driving, but it isn't. But but are they telling you to sit in the passenger seat? No, they've no. And and I do think the car. And I'm not. You know, I of course this is horrific. And I, but I think the car should have. You know, my car. If you get out of the passenger seat, or if you're too light, it says you know the the passenger airbag turns off or on. You know. Right. So clearly, you can detect. Um, with quite ease if someone's in that seat why is this system working the only when... way tesla knows is, there's nothing there's not a sensor in the driver's seat uh is when you torque the wheel a little bit and it is true that when self-driving is on it periodically will you know if you if it doesn't feel your hands on the wheel say torque the wheel but i have to point out that general motors or the cadillac ct6 and their their particular self-driving stuff ford's going to do the same thing with, I think they call it Blue Drive, something like that. Blue Cruise. Blue Cruise has a camera. Yeah, it's a little sensor. On the wheel, and it's an infrared camera, and it's checking not only to see that you're there, but that you're looking at the road. It watches, it looks where your eyes are. Yeah. Um, and, it's, it's, and that your eyes are open. Yes. Yeah, it, it's... So you're not sleeping. I mean, you could keep your hands off the wheel, but as soon as you... Like, I, I tested it with, like, you know, putting on sanitizer. And so as soon as I started making those motions with the hands, like yeah. doing something else, that's yeah. when it said, you got to put your hands back on the wheel. But otherwise, I mean, their system is engineered to let you have your hands off the wheel comfortably. Um, but you do have to be paying attention, like you said, looking straight right. ahead. So I don't understand why this Tesla that's so hyped up... Um, it doesn't have something like that. And I've seen little videos of people where they rig like a hand on the wheel that moves it every so often or some kind of pressure on the wheel. Um, so I don't really understand that. Part of the worldview, probably, right? Freedom. Freedom. You're not going to be babysat in a Tesla. That probably <laughs> sort of goes along the lines of Elon Musk's worldview yeah, as well. So don't, so. But folks, don't get in the back seat. I just read that it took four hours to put that fire well, out. That's another Yikes. problem. And that actually, thirty-two thousand gallons of water. <laughs> but that's because traditional yeah. firefighting methods don't work on lithium-ion batteries because they generate their own oxygen. So you can't smother a lithium-ion fire. You need to have the right kinds of chemicals to put it out. And obviously, in this case, the Houston Fire Department did not. They tried to put it out with water, which didn't work. Didn't work. So for the basically the car burned itself out, and I, I suspect that's the cause of death because if you look at the vehicle, uh, there sure isn't much left of that. Um, they wanted to go for a drive just before they left, and we're talking about the vehicle's driverless features. I'm going to guess because you do have to torque the wheel that the one guy got in the back seat, dumb. <laughs> and the other guy got in the passenger seat and was just torquing the wheel once in a while, but he wasn't driving the car. 59 and 69 years old. I'm not sure which one was the uh, the driver, but it's a, it's these, a tragedy. Um, I know the Teslas have a lot of cameras. Are they recording what's happening? And, and um... Not in the cabin, unfortunately. Everywhere else, yeah. Okay. Tesla will have a lot of telemetry from this crash. They'll know exactly what speed... Uh, when the self-driving was invoked and all of that, they'll probably know why the car went off the road, but that's not unusual because, you know, if, if the markings fade out, they were not on a highway, they were on a um, side street. But I think you're right, Leo. One of the things that you said right right up front here, the the original sin in this, yes. in this uh, case is the fact that the marketing department at Tesla was able to brand this product as full self-driving. And, you know, and if you pay extra, you can get the beta of stuff, which is even more full self-driving. And, and, you know, the F for any other kind of product, Federal Trade Commission, if you 
calls, if you label something in such a misleading way, they will hammer you down with a, a you know, a 20 pound sledge. Um, and, and that's really what needs to happen here because this is not full self-driving. This is, no. this is driver assist technology and it's, it's very good driver assist technology, but the messaging that is coming across is, uh, is just all wrong. And it's, it's guaranteed to lead to situations like this. Yeah. Well, we see it all the time. There's a, there are TikTok videos of people in the backseat of their tesla just stop it don't it's not a good idea but isn't that isn't that what tesla is promising yeah isn't, they said I mean, they call it exactly. full self-driving and not, so i think that's the thing four. it's like yeah uh, you know exactly it's not the different level but if you're just a consumer that buys this you believe it um, sure yeah and there's also a level of you want to test it out and and where how far do you go to test it out um, thinking that this is um, faultless. I mean, you, you, you no, know? these these guys were not daredevils. They were my age. They just thought they could do it, and they thought, let's try it out. It'll be fun. Um, uh, this is the theme of the show: truth and advertising. Truth, right? Yeah, the companies yeah. are you know welcome to tell us about what they're doing, but just be honest about it. Yeah. And in this case, it costs lives. Yeah. Um. Let's see couple of other uh oh i know what i want to talk about facebook's oversight board you had a good alex uh, you had a good article about it on your uh, big technology uh, newsletter the oversight board has decided to defer their decision about donald trump it's one of the cases they've been working on uh of course facebook uh did was it after january 6th or before january 6th banned after after they 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 acted in an, in a <laughs> And then, uh, in an excess of courage, they decided to ban Donald <laughs> Trump after the insurrection on January 6th. Uh, but the Facebook's uh, advisor board is taking that, oversight board is taking that on, uh, and will decide if that ban was justified and whether to reinstate the former president. Um, is the board working, Alex? What do you think? Well, there, there's two sets of opinions on this, which is something I laid out in the newsletter. On one hand, people say that this is a, a really just a head fake that the board can only review certain uh, uh, content moderation decisions, not the recommendation algorithms, not the group, they can't take down groups, they can't review, you know, the fundamentals of the product. So they're really just dealing with the periphery and Facebook is like making it seem like we have a say where we really don't. The other side of it, you know, talking about whether the board makes a difference is people are like, well, what other choice do we have? What alternative is there? And so you can have Facebook make the decision, you can have the government make the decision, or you could have some form of public representation make the decision. I personally think it's good to have the public make the decision in some way, even if it's limited. And this is a good start. So I'm really curious to see what they ended up you know, ruling. I don't think we should say that like, okay, Facebook's washed its hands of all of its problems now that it has some third parties making a call like this, but it is pretty significant that it's not Facebook itself making the decision of whether to ban Trump or not. And it is going to go to this board. And I'm really curious what happens if Trump actually does return to Facebook, because then Facebook becomes um, the one platform that's going to have Trump on it. He's not on Twitter. I think he's been banned from YouTube, too. And how does that change, you know, the the nature of Facebook if, you know, Facebook becomes Trump HQ while the others are are not? And I, I'm pretty intrigued by what ends up happening over the next couple of weeks and you know they deferred it a little bit but i i anticipate that this thing is going to come you know end of april early may uh and it'll be really fascinating to see the outcome they say they wanted to defer because they received nine thousand comments they asked for feedback and they <laughs> wanted to read all nine thousand uh comments never read the comments never read I mean, the never comments <laughs> if there's one thing never we've learned the so, Alex, I thought that was um, it was a great column, uh, I, and two things struck me about it. Number one, that you had the same expert um, uh, yeah. at commenting on both uh, opposing sides of the question, mm -hmm. which which really st struck me as identifying the core of how you know just just. It, insurmountable this problem seems to be but the other thing is i i thought you wrote something that just it, it just i wanted to see it bold-faced i wanted to see it leap out you said for years people have questioned whether one company should have all that power but facebook has the power now 
And that's kind of a theme of how we got to where we are in 2021. Companies like Uber, companies like Facebook got here by uh, finding a weakness in the market and the regulatory structure, um, aggressively rolling over any kind of regulation that is there, and then acquiring the power and saying, well, we have the power now. You can't we, you know, we have to find a way to deal with this. And, you know, and, and the third option here is to say, you know, Facebook, you're out of business, you know, or, <laughs> or you're broken up, you're broken into, I don't know, five different companies that do God knows what, but the, the, the idea that, well, we have the power now, and that's just a fait accompli seems like something that shouldn't be um, dismissed as, uh, you know, if, if, if you, if you got there, through horrendous anti-competitive ways that that um, that basically trampled on what we see as societal norms, uh, that maybe it's worth revisiting the decisions of how we got there. Will, no doubt. Will Twitter, if if Facebook reinstates, Twitter doesn't have a process like this at all, right? I mean. No, Trump, I, Trump is not coming back to Twitter. He's just not coming Stop. back. Ever. There's no Period. chance he's ever coming back. He's more associated with Twitter than he is with Facebook. Right. So, right. Right. He's gone. And and I have to say, I mean, just purely subjectively, life has been a little bit calmer <laughs> with that the da the daily forty or fifty tweets uh, from Donald Trump. But um, that's interesting. Do you? So why can't Facebook? Why why couldn't Facebook just have have the the, the nerve, the spine to do what what Twitter did, and just say we don't need an oversight board. We're just going to do it. Is, is Facebook's uh, oversight board a Money. better solution than Twitter just saying, yeah, we're just going to ban them forever? That's it. I, I, I don't know. The more I think about this oversight board, the more I like it. Uh, and, you know, I'm nervous to admit it in public because it's not a very popular stance. Um, but I generally think that, like, we shouldn't have Facebook making these choices. We shouldn't have the government making these choices. Yes, Facebook is making, uh, turning over a very narrow segment of its decisions to the public. Yes, it handpicked all the first members of, of the board. Uh, but, a, but a prestigious but, board. I mean, they're, they're yeah, good people. They're not. Exactly. Well, okay, there's an argument that, like, now Facebook can show these people to Congress and say, see, you can leave Section 230 in place. We have this all under control. So, okay, maybe they're, and those Actually, people are making six-figure salaries for 15 hours of work But a isn't week. Mark Zuckerberg saying good. you should change, he said, he testified, you should change Section 230. Yeah, I know, but it's you always like it. it's a change of the you know to turn a tiny dial to make it harder yeah. for the smaller companies and better for us. Yeah, that's the and don't that's don't the like change. change the like yeah. core protections. But I mean, ultimately, like we want, I think we want the public making these choices, and we don't want to make uh, have a man like Zuckerberg who runs a company who's unaccountable even to his own board uh, to be the final say on this. And so, so why do we I let Jack Dorsey that, do that? Well, <laughs> should he I mean, have a board? We, should there be a we, Twitter oversight board? Well, we don't. We don't let the. The thing is, it's not our choice. It isn't our choice. Uh, we don't let them do it. These companies are doing doing it on the on their own. Yeah. Um. I I wouldn't be upset to see some board, uh, like this set up for Twitter. Uh. But I do think that we need a view with nuance, which is, you know, let's let's look at the good for what it is, but also yeah. understand that part of it might be to de, to defer criticism. And I when we I get agree to that you. situation. That's bad. It's an intransigent problem it's a almost insoluble problem it's better to do something mm -hmm. than nothing exactly um, on the other hand i have to say i maybe it's just me but i feel like the day the day of twitter and facebook is those days are waning i don't know what's going to replace mm -hmm. them i don't know what the next thing is maybe it's tiktok i don't know maybe it's not social media my sense is maybe people are a little fed up with social media don't is that is that just me ed or does it feel like it, the the that's the Facebook and Twitter were very 2010. I'm just, I, yeah, I'm afraid I'm way too deep into these things. I'm, well, not, not into Facebook. I've been gone from Facebook for several years now and do not miss it one bit. Um, but I don't, I, I see evidence that, you know, Facebook's hyper growth in the U S in the United States has stopped. Well, yeah. Cause they have everybody. No Except for you and me, because they have everybody. Yeah. So there's, but there's no indication that their influence has stopped. 
Um, and there's no indication that Twitter's influence right. in terms of, uh, you know, sort of controlling the tentacles of attention to media has, has, uh, has stopped. But the whole thing about the, the advisory board strikes me as um, pure PR because there's, there's a thousand things that are happening every day that are having negative impacts on communities, on businesses, on people, on countries, on ethnic groups. And the advisory board is only going to deal with the high profile ones that are too hot for Mark Zuckerberg to handle. And so it becomes a way to uh, shovel those off and say, see, we have an independent board dealing with these while the horrible things that are happening on a more granular level, on a, on a more local level are still happening and are still at the mercy of Facebook's horribly broken or non-existent content moderation uh, architecture. So who should do that? I don't know who should do that. I wish that, the, you know, the, the fact that we're in a situation where somebody was able to build a thing where three billion people in the world are able to uh, launch a genocide, uh, you know, and, Not all and nobody thought about that from day one. You know, the, the idea that somebody has to say, well, whose job is it to fix that uh, sort of seems to me that uh, we're asking the wrong question here. Well, hmm. I, I mean, I think, you know, and I, I, I think that Facebook is something that has been a force that, um, you know, clearly Zuckerberg built it to be the force that it is. But can you predict every single impact that this device, machine, whatever is going to have? And I think that's what Facebook is dealing single. with. You can't predict every single impact, but you could predict the negative outcomes that were going to happen here, and none of them were accounted for in the original thing. People who know how networks work saw this coming a decade ago, a decade and a half ago, and nobody listened to them. And now we're at the position where, well, who's going to deal with it? You know, it's just what we have. You know, I burning Facebook to the ground doesn't seem to me to be should not what, be rejected as an option. What about what about all the good that Facebook's done? I mean, I you know uh, the connections people have had, the uh, you know the impact it's it's had for businesses. Jeff and, Jarvis and, always you know, points to George Floyd. The first videos uh, of his murder were on Facebook. Um, so yeah, they've done some good. But I mean, it's 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 done good and bad. And I think like anything else that's new. It, there's going to be a learning curve. And I'm not, believe me, I'm not defending Facebook. I'm not on there either. I mean, I'm on there in a public way, but right. privately I'm, I'm done with it because it was, it was no longer providing me the value that I wanted. Right. right. Um, and Twitter, I mean, you know, I use Twitter and I think, I think Twitter is, is quite possibly the perfect social media. It, it, Twitter to me is a phone number that everyone has access to, right? If you tweet me, Theoretically, I'm looking at my tweets and I can see your message along with anyone else in the world. I think that's amazing. Um, right. You know, and is Twitter to me a lot of um, nonsense and things that just kind of percolate that are kind of give me a break? Sure. Um, you know, do I think it should go away or be burned to the ground? No. And I think that, you know, and, and to answer Leo with, with um, you know, social media in general, I mean, look, this is this is a force in our world that will never go away. It will it might be reinvented. But at this point, we see the, um, you know, TikTok, like you said, and we see, you know, Instagram is still just Instagram's beginning huge, yeah. to grow. Yeah. I mean, it's still just at the beginning. Um, and the influence that that has on travel, on places people go on, on everything is just absolutely unbelievable. And will there be something else to overtake it? Maybe. Um you know, and Facebook, I think there's, you know, I think there's, a, I don't know, as someone who uses it in a public way, I think it's amazing. You know, I took a video yesterday, I posted it, and I, the comments and the discussion I get on my page is just phenomenal. And I find it to be really interesting. And, um, you know, I'm not in the political world, so maybe that's it. I'm just, you know, I talk tech. But I will say I have seen in the past couple of years the political fallout on my tech page. You know, I work for a news station, and people used to take what I said as, 
it was real. And now every time I post something, well, how do I know you're you're real? How do I know this is not fake news? I mean, it's, you know, the impact has been seen across the board. And I, I do find that part quite interesting as well. I think, Leo, the, the question that you asked about, you know, what's going to happen is, and our Facebook and Twitter going by the wayside uh, was really fascinating because I think right now we're living in the most dynamic moment uh, as far as these social media companies go that I've seen since I started covering them about a decade ago which is that we now have uh, TikTok is insurgent and TikTok is unbelievable. I mean, there are so many complications with TikTok, but the product itself is incredibly addicting. And I just picked it up during uh, lockdown because I was bored and I am sucked in all the way. And I think that poses a serious challenge to Facebook. And then you think about some of this but audio it, stuff. And, and I would Clubhouse. point out before you move on, yeah, it, the, it also points out that what we might have thought of for years is imp the possibility of, de of dethroning Facebook is not mm -hmm. impossible. That there are new ways yeah. to do stuff. There are new ideas. Yeah. You said Clubhouse, another mm -hmm. example. Yeah, and now now Facebook and Twitter are are running. They're not walking to cut to copy Clubhouse. Yeah, uh, Twitter with Spaces. Facebook, I think, is about to announce something on Monday, uh, and so uh, Wait, yeah, I would a, say the incumbents a, are under threat. Well, is that some breaking news or what? Or is that? Uh, oh, yeah, Peter there was a Kafka, report. There was a report yeah, Peter today. Kafka this reported is coming. Something, Peter Kafka reported something today about the, um, the what Facebook's announcements are going to be. And it's very much a Clubhouse clone. Yeah, what a surprise. For my, yeah, for just the like, money, I think. Just, yeah. like, just like Instagram uh, copied stories. I mean, mm -hmm. if if nothing else, Facebook's very adept at copying other people and buying what they can't copy. Uh, and that's part. I think you could make the strong argument that Facebook's success really has come from the fact that they, you know, they put Instagram and WhatsApp quickly out of business by buying them and and making sure that their success was Facebook's success. Maybe the same thing with Oculus. I don't know. Uh, you know, and they, and and Facebook putting stories on Instagram immediately kind of hurt Snapchat when they couldn't buy them. I don't know. It's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. I just don't feel like Facebook owns the future necessarily or Twitter at it all. It feels less so now than it has yeah. in a long time. It's a dynamic moment, as you say. And look at the failures of Facebook. I mean, look at how many things they've started that, I mean, remember a couple of years ago, they did that big Facebook watch push where they were getting into, you know, shows that they were producing. And yeah. it's like, Flop. you know, a lot of the stuff that these companies do never works Flop. out. I mean, Google's the same yeah. way, you know, yeah. there, there's primary well, Google's the king of failures. Years. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Google's so good at oh, that. We, yeah. But well, we want them, we want them to fail. Uh, in, but in that's what I'm cases. saying. So it gives us hope for the fact that, you know, if, in, if Facebook is huge. They've got 3 billion people on the platform and they couldn't make shows where they paid people millions of dollars right. to produce YouTube style shows. They couldn't make that work. So that well, gives us hope yeah. that this is not just a numbers game of, you know, just, you know, uh, pull, uh, pushing their way into things. Right. Well, one interesting thing about Facebook Watch is uh, after they invested all that money into it, they all of a sudden did a study and they found out that passive consumption on Facebook actually makes people feel bad. And so they shifted the algorithm. Oh, away that's from right. I remember that. More active. That's right. And there went Watch. <laughs> yeah. So, so Facebook, if they're going after Clubhouse... But you might also say they're going after Spotify or at least the podcast uh, ambitions of Spotify. Um, although they're going to they're going to connect a podcast discovery product that will be connected with Spotify. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, I don't I think so that. I don't know if I think Mark G Zuckerberg is a product genius or not. I think there's a lot of evidence he's not. Well, you know, I would I would argue that none of the current tech CEOs are product geniuses. Uh, what they do very well is listen to their employees and then elevate those ideas to, you know, people who can actually make decisions and end up building the stuff. Like Jeff Bezos didn't come up with all the stuff we talked about at Amazon on his own, but he's a very right. good listener. And I would say the same with Zuckerberg. You know, we talked a little bit about the oversight board having 9,000 things because they asked for feedback and now they have to delay. And that didn't come out of nowhere. I mean, it is the Facebook oversight board and the Facebook ethos is all about feedback. And yeah. Facebook wouldn't be where it is today if there weren't specific people inside the company that pulled Zuckerberg over and said, you know what, Mark, you're doing it wrong. And if we don't do it this way, we're in trouble. That happened with mobile. That happened with stories. 
And so, you know, I think, and the, the nice thing for Facebook is that Zuckerberg actually will listen. Uh, and that's how they've been able to stay relevant. Yeah. Let's take a quick break. Lots of little stories. I'm going to uh, kind of do a speed round when we come back. But first, because it is getting late, first a word from Uber for Business, our sponsor for this segment of This Week in Tech. It's, it's hard to find uh, easy ways, simple ways to keep employees engaged, to keep customers happy, uh, especially now when you can't really do face-to-face -face interaction. If you're finding uh, looking for a way to stand out to your customers or make your employees feel extra valued, I want to point you at Uber for business. What a great idea. Uh, you know, you know Uber as a way to request rides, uh, to order meals from restaurants you love. But Uber has a platform for businesses, specifically for businesses, to spiff their employees and their customers. Over 150,000 companies use Uber for business to improve customer and employee satisfaction. I'll give you some examples. Add $20 uh, to somebody's personal Uber account and say, come on, I'll give you, I'll buy you a ride to our next event, or I'll buy you a coffee while you attend our uh, meeting, uh, or just to thank an employee for working late, buy him a meal from Uber Eats. It's a great way to make customers love your business even more, offer them a voucher for a free meal or ride when they make their first purchase or spend a certain amount. Here's the great thing. Uber for Business is easy for you. You can sign up for free. You can immediately, I mean, like, before I'm done with the ads, start delivering extra value to the people who matter most to your business. Vouchers couldn't be easier to send. Same thing for redeeming them. You get total control over who gets them, when they expire. You can even say what portion of the ride or what portion of the meal you want to cover. You, you share them via email you, or by text, and they, they can be redeemed just with a click. And based of all, you don't pay for any rides or any meals until they take the ride or they order the meal. So it's a great way to get you know, get some great stuff out and maybe not even uh, cost you too much. For a limited time, in fact, I'm going to make it an even better deal. Get a $50 voucher when you create your first vouchers campaign and spend $200. Go to uber.com slash twit to find out more. Uber, U-B-E-R dot com slash twit. Terms and conditions apply. Uber.com slash twit. Wow. Wow. Amazon, you know, they're doing uh, the Lord of the Rings TV show, I guess, for uh, Amazon Prime. They're, they're going to do a series. They we, are, we knew they spent, what was it, $100 million to buy the rights? Now they say it will cost $465 million for the first season. Who, this is, what a crazy world we're in now. Almost half a billion dollars. It's good for New Zealand. The New Zealand Minister of Economic Development Tourism says this will be the largest television series ever made. One season, almost half a billion dollars. I'm sorry, they spent $250 million for the rights. They spent a quarter of a billion. So they're already, they're already almost to a billion dollars before they've even aired anything. Uh, all right, nothing to say. That's the story. There you go. Moving. <laughs> I'm into it. I I'm can't into wait to it too. I thing. can't wait. I like those movies. Have you got to tell yeah, the whole season? Well, how much did all the, that money? How much Dang. did those movies cost? I mean, I mean, they were. I'm sure hundreds of millions of dollars. You're right. And the and the Lord of the Rings. There were three of them. Three Hobbits. So you're right. Uh, but it means. I guess what I like about it, it means they're going to put the kind of production value into it that, that, that was put in the original movies, right? I just pulled it up. Uh, Ninety-three million. Oh, for not Lord even of the close. Rings extended uh, uh, extended cut Fellowship of the Ring. So that's one of three. So three hundred million three. total. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I. But what it does tell you is how this market has been bid up by Netflix, by Amazon Prime, by HBO. This has become. And I think some of it's due to pandemic, but I think it's really become a very fat market. And boy, it's a great time for to be a content creator. I got to get that script out of the bottom drawer. <laughs> Actually, great time to watch stuff, too. Yeah, it's a great time to be a content consumer. Uh, have you seen the, the time lapses from Google Earth? This actually is maybe a little too depressing. Uh, showing the devastating effects of climate change. Um, you can actually watch uh, as climate change progresses. Uh, you have to go to Google Earth, click on the Voyager tab, and then uh, search for one of five guided tours about forest change, urban growth, warming temperatures, mining, and renewable energy resources. 
Here's a, a GIF. It'd be easier for me just to show this of how Cape Cod has changed uh, over time. Uh, or the glacier retreat, uh, the Columbia Glacier. Bye bye, glacier. Bye bye. Um, thank you, Google, for really, really bringing, bringing the show down. How about that uh, Lord of the Rings for $400 million? <laughs> New Surface Laptop 4. Paul Thorat was so unimpressed. Ed Bot, surely you're more excited. Mm, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's, this is, uh, it, it's, a, it's a very nice... I did a, actually an article this week sort of analyzing the, what the Surface product lineup is right now. And in every case they get to the point where they identify, uh, design and build uh, a successful product, and then they stop and they iterate on it. And so this is iteration. Yeah. Uh, you don't, you know, you don't, it, it works. How People important like is it. this business to Microsoft? The, you know, they say that there's two aspects of it. Um, you know, and the, the biggest part of it is to serve as an example to a, their, almost a uh, reference OE, for the OEM OEMs. partners, a reference, yeah. a reference platform, or, or something, and that, and the other is to be uh, a, a place where people can say, "All right, this is what this is how Windows should work." You know, third parties, third party hardware, and third party crapware has always been the 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 Achilles heel of the Windows hardware ecosystem. So this was, that was the two twin goals of this. But now that they've got it up to making $2 billion a quarter, um, it strikes me that this is no longer a reference platform. This is a, this is a business. And what they're really doing instead of being a reference platform is being a competitive spur to the partners and saying, look, be better than us. And, and you can make lots of money, uh, you know, and if you keep, you know, don't shovel crapware onto things. Don't deliver uh, cheap plastic stuff that breaks or that you know blue screens every time you you turn it on. You know, step up your game. So it's not so much a reference platform anymore as a baseline competitor. Let me ask you this though, because I, I was thinking about this when, in, in the conversation on Windows Weekly with Paul and Mary Joe. The Surface, there's a Surface laptop. There, there's right. a Surface Book even still around. That was the convertible. Yes. Oh, yeah. It's quite successful. Is Surface it? Book 3. Okay. Yeah. But really, when people, when you say Surface to people, they think of the convertible, the tablet that t the keyboard comes off, which Microsoft clearly made in response to Apple's iPad. And I don't, are other, I know there are other convertibles, but I don't see very many of them. Are the OEMs looking at that and going, yeah, no, we're not going to make the detachable keyboard thing? Uh, the detachable, so there's there's six product lines in the Surface. Three of them have kickstands. Three of them are, are conventional notebooks with the Surface Book being the one that is detachable if you want it to, but right. you don't have to. And it's nobody did. A, I mean, I owned one for years and never, never took the screen solid, off. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, but I think other people... Uh, Some know, people, people might, in, yeah. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's a niche, it's a niche market. But if you were an architect or a pro, or a designer, uh, you might find maybe that that's it. I don't have the use case. You know, Microsoft talks about exactly. first line workers holding the surface in their arm as they check guests into a flight or things like that. And I just and, that's not me. Uh, yeah. I use a laptop. If I'm going to use a laptop, I want a laptop. I don't even want an. But I'm going to go back to your your original question was. People think of the surface. When you say people, I think you're thinking of of consumers, yeah. like a tech tech savvy consumers like us who were paying attention ten years ago or nearly ten years ago when this was. They uh, did the click you know, ad and they were twirling it around. That was nine. That was nine years ago. <laughs> there was, you know, the iPhone. The iPhone was one year old. Uh, oh, okay. when, when that came out, that was a long time ago. Right now, the Surface is a business-centric uh, family of of PCs and a business-centric brand. And most of what you see is coming through the commercial channel right now. So, from a that, consumer, and that's point what of view, Paul explained to me. Right, and that's why there's no Thunderbolt or, or USB four ports. 
businesses are very conservative. And I, I was surprised. I thought of it as a consumer product, but it's really a business well, product. Well, I think it consumers are going for cheaper alternatives. If, that's right. You know, that's, it's too that's expensive. That's the main thing. Yeah. These are very expensive yeah. computers, yeah. Uh, and they're they're beautiful. I mean, if, if I was purchasing a Windows laptop, this would be what I'd want. Which one would you um, get? I'd go for the Surface laptop. I don't yeah. need the detachable thing. Yeah. I like just a, you the know. The laptop's a conventional laptop. Ultrabook, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I, you know, these start at 1000 bucks. These are, you know, they're the high end of things. Um, but they do offer some advantages for, you know, if you like the Windows platform. I think they're, they're a really nice device. Um, yeah. But they're expensive. So the consumer, even when you look at, you know, they came out with that Surface, uh, it was like the Surface Go and it was like it started at like 329 it was supposed to be cheaper but when you added everything up you know what they show on those commercials you add up the keyboard and you add up the pen it gets pretty pricey and you know consumers want something they go into best buy for sub 500 that's probably the most popular kind of laptop price for the average yeah. person um, yeah, so a couple, by the way so a couple things there yeah a couple things there so no one the prices are you can match them up uh unit for unit against MacBooks. Uh, so they're, they're MacBooks very are expensive also. Yeah, they're very but, similar. But the yes, prices are, are yeah. almost identical. And the Surface, the, the but cheaper- But most consumers aren't buying MacBooks. Want. Well, right, but but they're, they're and, and, and most of the people, most of the cheap PCs that are out there have zero profit margin in them. And so the only people who are in those businesses are people who can survive on, you know, microscopic margins like Lenovo, which can make them by the gazillion and shove them through Walmart and make $10 on each one and, and be done with it. But the, the product that you actually want there is, is what's called the, the Surface Laptop Go, which was the one that came out last fall. And you can get one for about 600 bucks and it's actually a pretty decent PC. <laughs> yeah, and the, the cheap computers, by the way, are horrible. I mean, they're- Yeah, you know, I always try to like talk one... consumers out of it, but you know, it's hard to yeah, tell somebody, really you gotta spend because... more than 500 bucks, sorry. Exactly. They're still horrible. Yeah, and they and guess what? They don't last very long. So when you're talking, you know, $1,000 seems really expensive. It's a false economy, yeah. Yeah. And uh, by the way, one little tidbit I learned um, doing a story at the Microsoft store back when they existed, and Ed, this goes kind of back to what you're saying about the crapware on these things, is that if you bought a computer at the Microsoft store, whether it was a Surface or a you know third party, those computers were not allowed to have crapware on them. So they could not have the all that. They so, were called signature pieces. The signature, yeah, yeah. Microsoft yeah. signature program. Yeah. Yep. I thought that was pretty interesting. Nobody because, did it. You know, <laughs> 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 you see them all over, right? No. <laughs> yeah, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> they must make a lot of money on that trial where. Actually, it's Tell funny that we're could. talking about yeah, cheap must. laptops because Neilai Patel uh, did a, a piece on The Verge, a little a trip down memory lane, uh, talking about the netbook. And oh. the, and the, oh. There was an the example worst. of how the public's thirst for cheap really backfired. I think it hurt the PC industry for years. People's sense of what a cheap pc could do was really damaged by that that may be the other reason why microsoft makes these surfaces just to remind well, people a windows experience could be you know gorgeous and and nice right and if you're the average consumer that spent you know let's say 250 on a netbook back in the Ugh. day and it's terrible from the first boot up you realize like Ugh. why is this so slow and horrendous in the screen you can't view <laughs> from any angle work except and, direct on yeah, but you just spent 250 and what do you do you got to stick with it for yeah. as long as humanly possible so now you have this computer for four years it, it, that just is terrible torture. and it's torture exactly torture. and it's trashing the brand exactly of every company that is aligned with it. So that Intel sticker on it, yep. I hate Intel. Yep. That Windows sticker on yep. it, I hate Windows. Yep. You know, yep. the 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 you know, whatever other stickers are on that thing and whatever bundled software came with it, you know, people, you know, that that was that was sort of the golden age of the Mac right then as people people migrated to it, it probably uh, helped Mac Apple. platform in droves. It probably helped them. It says, oh you get what you pay for. Spend a little yeah, more so money. So you go to the Apple store and they're like, oh, let me show you our cheapest computer for $9.99 or whatever. Yeah. And you're like, oh, never mind. Uh, a little and more by money. the way, <laughs> you mentioned the stickers. Why did they allow stickers on these computers? I mean, <laughs> come on. $10, Ten each. I, I had a meeting with, with uh, Michael Dell one time and I asked him 
you know, that question about idea. the crapware and everything. He said, he said to me, how much would you pay to not have <laughs> these bundled software and stickers on there? And I said, I said, I don't know, 20, 25 bucks. He says, sold. I'll take it. That's all wow. it takes. That's all it's, they make on that crap. That's how much they made on that thing. And yet that was their entire profit margin. That's the thing. That's now the think key. About it. It's their profit margin. And hold on. What is Amazon doing with the Kindle and all those fires? They've got those ads on the home screen right. or on the lock screen. And you have to pay like $20 to get they're, rid of them. They're actually less annoying, though, than the stickers in the bundle. Wear. Well, yes, but it's the <laughs> it's the high tech. It's the digital sticker. <laughs> yeah, it Your, is. Your home screen it has is. an ad for something. <laughs> do, you, do you guys get it on Dogecoin? Oh, 32 no. cents, 400 percent up in a week. This was a joke cryptocurrency based on the Shina Ibu Doge meme. Father Robert I was going to trade my I, think, I was going right? to trade my GameSpot stock for Doge. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the uh, uh on Monday uh executives from GM Ford the chip manufacturers met with the president Biden uh pledged 50 billion dollars not nearly enough to solve the chip shortage. Uh unfortunately it's going to be with us for a while, probably, uh, according to Pat Gelsinger uh, of CEO of Intel, into 2023. Intel's building two new plants in Arizona. TSMC is committing uh, $12 billion to build a plant in uh, Arizona as well. But thanks to natural disasters, COVID-19, exponential consumer demand, there are, you know, car assembly lines shut down. You can't get a lot of parts. Uh, and that's going to last for a couple more uh, years. Uh, $50 billion from the government as part of his infrastructure plan. Uh, Gels Gelsinger says that's not nearly enough. But I, I welcome it, but we need even even more. Even more. Uh, so just bad news. If you're looking for an NVIDIA <laughs> GTX 3080, good luck. Oh, gosh, there's so much uh, little stuff. Um, the... Uh, Ingenuity helicopter flies tomorrow for a brief period of time. Exciting. Um, yes. Yeah. It's that's gonna, on Mars. That's, right? a, that's on Mars. Yeah, it wouldn't, nice. be a, it wouldn't be a story if it were on Earth. It's, yeah. a, <laughs> it's a story on Mars. The dual prop helicopter, first uh, of its kind for Mars. Is that, a, is that an Uber sticker I see on the wing there? <laughs> the Somebody saw that? Remember last CES, there were uh, all of these, there were at least two different helicopter car Uber manufacturers with yes. giant helicopters on the show floor. D did that helicopter like cr climb out of the belly of the dropped um, little rover inches. thing? Yeah, dropped off the Perseverance rover. Off of the, so off the cool. Belly. Yeah. Yeah, really I mean, cool. This is fascinating. These science it's people, so they really science. know what they're doing. Yeah, science. Like <laughs> How they're doing this is just I, I you know it's it's getting a lot of press but it's just so like out there that you're like this this thing is I don't know millions and millions of miles away I don't know is it billions I don't know but it's, it's so far away that it's 15 <laughs> minutes for the radio signal so this thing has to fly completely autonomously uh, because hmm. uh, you know you can't control something 15 minutes later you go up so they're gonna say go and uh, that and we'll know and in fact it's not only gonna take 15 minutes to get the signal back but it, because of the speed of the uh, uploads and everything, it's going to probably be three or four hours before NASA has anything to say about this flight. So I'll, we'll all be watching and waiting. Wow. So is it going to give us like drone footage of what Mars looks like? Eventually, the plan is for reconnaissance for uh, Perseverance. So it'll fly ahead, uh -huh. look around, oh. say, oh, yeah, this might be interesting. It's uh, Here's a clear path, that kind of thing. Man, it's you're 140 about space before earlier, yeah. but like we are, we are, we are really making are some spacing, amazing man. breakthroughs here. Yeah. It's pretty unbelievable. Yeah. Like watching the way that the rocket lands, and now we have a helicopter that's going to fly around Mars. I mean, this stuff is step changes from. Where you're we young enough; you might them. actually be uh, one of the first colonists. You could go. Oh, I'm not going. Okay, I'll stay here. Just going <laughs> to just giving you. you, you give up all your 140 data million. To go. 140 million miles, by the way. Oh, Jeez. man. So we okay. just did lockdown for a year. That's enough isolation That's enough. for me for enough. a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, the New York Police Department is deploying SPOT in the Manhattan public housing complex. That's a good idea. They got robot dogs, robot police dogs in New York City. 
I saw it, it made me so angry um, because we had been seeing all these robots and like, you know, the uh, the initial reaction is like, oh, are these robot dogs going to kill us? And of course, it's going to be the way that people use the robots that's going to be the issue. And the fear was never the robots at the end of the day. No, it was the people, people controlling them. the robots. And it just seeing that video of the two cops walking that robot dog just, you know, it sort of brought it all home. It was like, yeah. oh, yes, yeah. this is the issue. Here it comes. That's this is talk about science fiction. It's RoboCop for crying out loud. What could wanna, possibly go wrong? Oh my God! Let's see. Let's let's see this again. Set, by the way, seventy million dollars or something. What is that right? Can that be right? Is that what the headline said? This was one? a good idea. That's ridiculous. Your robot dogs. Can, for that. Yeah. Really. Yeah. No thanks. Uh, that's just a little too creepy. And wait, where are they deploying it first? In a housing project. Yeah, go put it on the Upper East I'm sorry, $70,000. That's a little bit And bad. what are they doing? What's this robot doing? Surveillance, um, obviously. Surveillance, yes. So it has, like, cameras, and it's just kind of keeping an eye Looking on Looking around, checking out the scene, getting down on the corner with a, in the hood. It's bristling with sensors. Bristling. I guarantee you. It, it, I mean, you know that the, the malls are doing this, um, you know, with that night scope, I think it's called, where it, you know, it, it kind of wanders around taking video. I mean, this this is just the beginning. We're going to see a lot more of this. We're living and, in the future, kids. I mean, surveillance society. I mean, it's just, it's it's happening in yeah, a big way. And it's, yeah, you know, people's yeah. homes, the same thing. Yeah. You, you know, you got cameras around your house now. See, I'm more worried about robot dogs than I am about Google Flock, to be honest, to be fair. Same. I would agree and with we that. Have a, yeah. there, we have an opportunity now to like raise the alarm over this type of stuff. It should yeah. not be happening. And there's going to be a slippery slope where eventually like, it'll be like, well, everyone's doing it. And then it'll be too late. Right. Well, okay. So now when you say it shouldn't be happening, I'm curious. Like at the airport, should we have dogs? Like if these dogs could. Doggy you know, dogs. Um, little doges. That's Okay. Shina Ibu who comes up and sniffs your crotch. I don't mind. I'm okay with that. But I, you don't, you want that robot dog sniffing you? I don't no. know. I mean, no. I think we, we're already over policed. So <laughs> I don't. I, police and don't want I, don't more I'm technology. Not, yeah. yeah, I'm not in the yeah. defund the police camp. Like I think the police play an important role in society. But I mean, come on, robot dog. Like we can't. We if we if we're failing with the humans that we have now, I don't think the problem is lack of technology i think the problem is with the system so yeah. why don't we look there first and then decide whether we really need robot dogs with sensors walking around <laughs> the neighborhood yeah but what if they could and, and, scan luggage you know you know have you ever seen these dogs that they train to like you know sniff out drugs i mean that's a yeah. huge you know it's a it's a big thing so if you can program these robots to to do that and they can scan the luggage I mean, is that bad? I mean, it's like, where does it start and where does it end the bad part of this? You know, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm not, I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud. I don't know. I think that at the end of the day, like, um, if you're doing that for a cost, like the, what, the, the reason you would bring the robots in instead of the dogs that we have trained to do this job right now is because you want them in there for a cost thing. And I would argue that training the dogs is not the real problem with cost in our government right now. Uh, you know, we, we well, is have, it cost or is it maybe I don't think bloated. dogs should be doing that? You know, they, these dogs, they basically, you know, I mean, they're working okay. eight hours, whatever. I mean, maybe it's better to have a robot offload that kind of job to versus a, yeah. an animal. Oh, well, see, I, I haven't heard what the animal rights folks say about it, but I think there's there's a balance, of course, between like, you know, what we want to do and whether we want to end up living in a robo police state. And I'd be very reticent to get us to the latter. Finally, but the we'll whole wrap. question. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. One last, the, the one whole last question thought comes on robot to, dogs. Okay. Yes. The, the whole question comes <laughs> down to. This is what happened, Leo. Now we're, we're going to have the <laughs> longest conversation on this. I should never stuff. brought that up. <laughs> In all, Sorry, look, Ed. this is this is a almost a canonical example of a technology where that is new, that's just being introduced, and instead of thinking about where it can go we're thinking about the processes and the deployment today. And the re the reason we're in trouble with things like Facebook and you know genocides in Myanmar is because nobody thought about where this is gonna be yep. in five years or 10 yep. years, where it could be and how we guide it in the right way 
and prevent the bad scenarios from happening. So the question shouldn't be, do we build these robot dogs? Do we deploy them? Where do we deploy them? How do we deploy them? We think about where does this end? And how do we make sure that it doesn't end in a way where we say in 10 years, holy crap, I didn't see that coming. Maybe the people that are building this stuff should have the dogs patrol their neighborhoods first before they put them in other Good idea. Yeah. And uh, by the way, because we have Club Twit has a Discord, there is a Club Twit channel, and maybe this was a mistake, but we've allowed animated GIFs and other movies in the Club Twit channel. Here's a video testing nine new mini cheetahs at <laughs> MIT. They take little steps, but they look actually a lot like the robot dogs. I don't know if we need nine of them. And uh, and then of course lots of gifs of dancing robots. So you see, you see. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Club Twit, for your contribution. <laughs> uh, sad note, real quick. Chuck Geschke passing away at the age of 81. Co-founder of Adobe. Uh, kind of a legendary fellow in Silicon Valley. We could thank him for the uh, the uh, tech museum in San Jose. He was one of the people who put that together and. It's a, it's a wonderful museum. I highly recommend it. He, uh, it, it. Of course, every obituary is going to mention that he was kidnapped at gunpoint uh, in 1992, held for four days, uh, suspect cocked with the $650,000 ransom, eventually led police to the hideout where he was held captive. He survived unscathed, retired uh, from the Adobe board in 2020, uh, but, but quite a legendary fellow in uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, Chuck Geschke uh, passed away at the age of 81 on Friday, founder with John Warnock of Adobe. And Warnock and uh, Geschke are credited with inventing PDFs. So next time you open a PDF, you can thank Chuck Geschke. That concludes this robotic edition of This Week in Tech. Thank you so much for being here, Alex. Uh, Kantrowitz is uh, at Substack. Well, he's at it's bigtechnology.substack.com. Where can we go to find the podcast? Yeah, you could type in uh, Big Technology Podcast on your app of choice, and it should come up. And nice. I will say that we talked a little bit about the Facebook Oversight Board's decision on Trump, which should be coming any any one of these weeks, and we'll do an emergency show on that, hopefully with someone oh, good. involved in the decision. Oh, so good. So stay tuned for that if nice. you subscribe. You've, got, you've had some great people. Zainab Tufeki, who I really love, Casey Newton, Tim Bray. Uh, some of the some of the best people, best voices in the business. So I uh, I think that's well worth listening to. Uh, thank thank you, you for being here, Alex. We really appreciate. Always your a pleasure. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's great yeah, being yeah, with you. Yeah. And I love the the mini surfboards behind you. Those are uh, thank you. Those are thank really you. cool. I like. That. I had to up this background game. Nice. Well um, done. We got the Room Raider Twitter account uh, dunked on me pretty hard. So did they? Oh hard man. Work. Yeah, because it was just a blank wall originally, yeah. and I think they called it a hostage video. So. <laughs> Been hard at work with my interior <laughs> decoration. So actually what you said means a lot to me. Thank oh, you. Oh, good. Yeah. And well, and it is National Park Week, so it's that's good right. to have Zion behind you as well. So that's good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, from uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, it's always great to have Ed Bot, the uh, creator of the Ed Bot Report, cdnet.com, at Ed Bot on the Twitter. I love your pillow. You see, Room Raider would like that pillow. Uh, it's like a little, little, what is it, a guitar pillow. That is a guitar pillow, yes. Yeah, I like it. That's cool. Anything you want to plug, Ed? Anything you up to you want to tell the world about? Uh, no, I'm in between books right now. So, Isn't know, that a just, good feeling? Who, who was feeling. it said said the best thing about writing is having written? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, so uh, nice having written. <laughs> yeah, looking looking forward to, you know, just doing that nice everyday life. Week, every day, every week stuff and... Let it, let it just float on past. It was Dorothy Parker who said, I hate writing. I love having written. Has <laughs> <laughs> anybody who's ever written a book will we'll, uh, absolutely concur. And, of course, Rich DeMuro, who is also an author. Rich's uh, iPhone book in its 18th printing now. <laughs> <laughs> every, every iOS update. God. You're going to do one for 14.5? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll do one eventually with kind of just some basic, you know, stuff that doesn't change as much. But no, I, I do my podcast, Rich on Tech and uh, Instagram. Those are my two big things right now. Instagram, nice. Rich on Tech, podcast, Rich on Tech. That's it. What do you put on, on? What TV. do you, what do you put on the Instagram? 
What's, what's, you know, what's um, on your Insta, I just, man? I love experimenting with, you know, just different things. Like I do, you know, I do tech stuff. I do, you know, I just- I wish I just, it, Facebook didn't community. own Instagram because I actually love Instagram. I was on it day one. And, and if Facebook didn't own it, I'd probably be still be there. But I just don't want to support Facebook in any way. But boy, you I know. I just, I find it's, it's the most- um, you know, the it's nicest nice. kind of platform right pictures. now. You know, it's, yeah. yeah, it's pictures and video and, yeah. you know, I, I, I love it. Yeah. Well, Wolf, you're rich on, uh, on Instagram. You're rich on tech on Twitter. You're rich on tech everywhere. That's the podcast too, rich on tech. Thank you, rich. Thank you everybody Thank for you. joining us. We do Twit every Sunday afternoon, 2.30 Pacific, 5.30 Eastern, 21.30 UTC. You can watch us stream it live at twit.tv slash live. There's audio and video there. The chat room, people watching live, irc.twit.tv. On-demand versions of all of our shows available at the website, twit.tv. Uh, you can also uh, get them on YouTube. There's a YouTube channel. Actually, if you go to the website, you'll see a link to the YouTube channel. Also to a couple of different podcast platforms where you can subscribe. We're on every podcast platform because, well, we're a podcast. So just search for Twit and you'll be able to subscribe and get it automatically of a Sunday. Don't forget the new Club Twit has launched. If you want ad-free versions of all of our shows, access to our Club Twit Discord channel and a, a whole new feed dedicated just to Club Twit, the Twit Plus feed, seven bucks a month, flat fee. That's it. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. We thank you for your support. Either way, watching the version with the ads or listening to the version without the ads, either way, we're happy. We're just glad you, you let us be part of your Sunday afternoon. I'm Leo Laporte. Thanks for joining us. Another twit is, is in the can. Bye -bye.